Hey everybody, this is Neil Pastrich, and welcome, or welcome back, to chapter 58 of three books. If you are new here, welcome, welcome. Have a seat on the couch. Just curl up into your dent there. Get cozy, get comfortable. You are listening to our epic 14-year-long quest to uncover and discuss the world's 1,000 most formative books. Three books at a time. From March 31st, 2018, all the way up to September 1st, 2031, on the exact minute of every single new moon and every single full moon, we are dropping, 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 dropping a new chapter of three books. Our goal is to use the power of reading to talk about life's biggest themes. We got no ads, no sponsors, no interruptions, no commercials, no book shame, no book guilt. We are an anti-snobbery force. That's a drop on what you're about to hear. And I am just so, so, so excited. So excited. You know why? Because the man I am about to interview or I already interviewed, I'm about to share with you, hasn't done a podcast in five years. The man I'm about to interview, when I search everywhere online, has never done an interview that I have found longer than, hmm, what, half an hour? Maybe there's a couple that are an hour? Certainly not this long. We had an opportunity to go deep into one of the deepest minds in the world. Yes, I don't say that lightly, because the Boston Globe calls him one of the most electric writers alive. Esquire says he's a genre-bending, time-leaping, world-traveling, puzzle-making, literary magician. The New York Times book review calls him a genius. He writes as though at the helm of some perpetual dream machine. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, have a seat. We are about to be enthralled by the fantabulous Mr. David Mitchell of Cork County, Ireland. He is the award-winning, best-selling author of Cloud Atlas, Black Swan Green, Number Nine Dream, Ghost Written, The Thousand Autumns of Jacob DeZoo, and The Bone Clubs. Five of those past six books, by the way, long-listed or short-listed for the Man Booker Prize. No small feat. And now, just a few days ago, he just dropped his new one. It is an absolutely epic book called Utopia Avenue. I have stopped reading it. At the time of this interview, I'd read 100 pages of this, about 500, 600 page book. And now I'm at about 400 pages and I, I've just stopped. I, I just know that I'm not going to get a David Mitchell book for a few years. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta savor this. I got to enjoy this like it is the richest, sweetest dessert I have ever eaten because that's what it feels like. I'm reading like a chapter every few days just to make it go slow. It is delicious. It is nutritious. It is magnificious. David Mitchell is here with us, and he is going to wow us. You know who this guy is? Let me tell you a couple more things. He's named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Um, he is married uh, uh, and has, has worked with his wife, who is Japanese, to translate from Japanese a couple international best-selling memoirs about autism, including The Reason I Jump and Fall Down Seven Times, Get Up Eight. He does himself have two children, including a child who is nonverbal on the autistic spectrum, which explains some of his particular interests, but he's open about that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. David Mitchell is a dream interview in so many ways. I personally spent, I don't know, 50 hours preparing for this interview because I was like, I wanted to listen to everything he's ever said. I wanted to read anything he's ever written. I wanted to soak in as much David Mitchell as I could. If you are coming to this show knowing who David Mitchell is, maybe you're in a same kind of wide-eyed, awestruck kind of mode that I'm in and you kind of get my gushing. But if you're not, come into it with an open mind. Get ready to hear from one of the most incredible authors in the world today as we talk about questions like, ah, why genres should not matter in writing and how they can be used as a tool within the same novel. Why doesn't snobbery belong in the world of writers and books? How should writing be judged? How do books change after they are read? How can books stop minds from scratching themselves raw? 
Which fantasy author does Dave Mitchell believe trumps Tolkien and why? How do writers build trust with their readers? How do we harvest imagination? What's the relationship between politics and healthcare and good writing? Who are the Russians and how does one wade into them properly? How do you define autism? What's the state of autism in the world today? What is the power and the meaning of the metaphysical? Guys, these are just some, some, some of the juicy topics we discuss in what I feel is just an incredible conversation. Now, enough of Neil, Neil, Neil. Let's get to David, David, David. Come on, guys. Strap in. Buckle up. Settle in, because this is going to be a good one. Let's go. Hi, David. Hello there, Neil. Uh, this is a treat. I am so grateful to you for your time today. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, thanks for your interest in my writing and my books. <laughs> it's more than interest. It is, uh, uh, I feel ensconced in your worlds. I have a pile of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine books beside me, all with your name on it. Um, including the the advanced readers version of your new book. Oh, wow. I have to tell you that, you know, I lost my love of reading um, in my 20s, early 30s. I don't know how that happened. Maybe it was too much school or something. Mm. And I lost my love of reading. I completely lost it. And then my wife and I stumbled into, very luckily, the premiere of Cloud Atlas at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2012. Right. And I was part of this gigantic standing ovation at the end. And I flew to LA the next day and the cover of the LA Times said longest ever standing ovation for a movie at TIFF. It was like 27 minutes, oh my word. Um, which I remember thinking like, that's a trick. Cause they just like introduced the cast one by one. <laughs> I mean, it was a, but, um, and then it, that is what led me to flipping open cloud Atlas. And when I fell into cloud Atlas, I have to tell you your books single handedly shook me. They moved me. They brought me into imaginative worlds. I'd never imagined. And it, that you made me the adult reader I am. I, I can't say I'm a pro reader, but like I moved from amateur to novice, from non-reading to reading because of you. I treasure your words. And I have, other than Slade House, which freaked me out, I have read every single thing that you've written. <laughs> oh, no, well, thank you for that uh, for that kind anecdote. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure something would have got you back into reading just from the way you're, uh, you're talking about your bibliophilia. Uh, so if it hadn't been Cloud Atlas, it would have been something else. Nonetheless, I, I'm honored it was Cloud Atlas. Um, as you'll know, uh, th th I'm a writer and I write the books I write. And um, I write them because, uh, because I'm unhappy if I don't write and a day doesn't feel like a day well spent without any writing in it, rather than... Uh, thinking about the effects that my books may have when they go out into the world, but when they do go out and when they have a kind of effect uh, like the one you just described, then I've, then I've, of course, I, I'm 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 enormously happy for for readers that they move. I've been at the receiving end of it. I'm a reader myself. You won't be surprised to learn. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I suppose, I'm just happy for the for the republic of letters that it is one soul stronger. Hmm. I love that phrase, Republic of Letters. Um, it's not your, my own. Bibliof your bibliophilia <laughs> is readily apparent on you, David. And I thought that may be a great place to start. As you know, the show is called Three Books. And so I have dug into your quotable past, your eminently quotable past, and I have pulled a slew of quotes from you about reading and or writing. I'd love to offer these up to you as a little plate, little little plate full of morsels. And I and any of them, I'm going to give you a big pause. If you can explain, expand, or elucidate any of these, it would be wonderful. Oh, the internet never forgets. But okay, open fire. Let's see what comes okay, up. Okay, here we go. To, from 2015, your interview on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, you said... It's convenient to have a horror section. It's convenient to have a science fiction section, a fantasy section. It's convenient to have a mainstream literary fiction section, but they should only be guides. They shouldn't be demarcated territories where one type of reader belongs and one type of reader does not belong. Um, well, uh, one of my better ones, I think, <laughs> there, Neil. Um, <laughs> I think I still believe all of that. Uh, I guess that's a comment about 
um, pigeonholing, and I suppose it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I don't like snobbery. Uh, I especially don't like snobbery in art. Uh, art should be an anti-snobbery force, and when I find it in art, it feels doubly wrong compared to when I find it in society. Um, and there are great writers working in all genres, and I also think that genre is is maybe analogous to a paint box. Uh, I think any single given writer, if he or she wishes, uh, should be allowed, or it, it, it's not really allowed, but it, it should raise no eyebrows if... Um, if the writer wishes to treat genre as another organ of the novel, another component of the novel, like plot or structure or, 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 or character or style um, or ideas or themes, uh, I think genre, you can make an argument, maybe it comes into style, but maybe you can make an argument for it actually being its, its, its own thing. And how odd that there should still be the vestiges of of a kind of um, an, 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 an imposter police force in the Republic of Letters that sometimes <laughs> tries to say, no, come on, you're a serious literary writer. You shouldn't be messing around with dragons in your book. Um, mm. If... If it's art, it's art. If it's good, it's good. If it's not, it's not. But um, but let's take every work on its own merit and and assess it on its terms, not on terms imposed by sclerotic ideas about what a writer, any given writer, should or shouldn't be writing. And how do we do that with the pressures of time, the necess- necessity of filtering in order to navigate the gigantic, flat complexities of, you know, if I want to follow someone or buy a newspaper or a magazine, I, I, I feel like I, I, I use and rely on the idea of genre just to be able to nap, just to be able to walk in. Your work is so beautifully unclassifiable, right? In the sense that, as you mentioned, there's fantastical elements. There's, you know, it's very literary. And, and then you have, the, there's, there's, I mentioned Slate House kind of feels like a horror, but don't we need to have filtering and sorting and all that stuff in place, you know, in order to keep moving? I, I, I suffer from this as well. I, I, my books are sometimes just all dumped in self-help, but I think of them in my own head as like, oh, that's kind of a memoir crossing with business. Like I'm playing with them in different ways in my own head. Oh, that sounds good. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Like, I feel like I, I get what you mean and I want to be able to do that, but I don't know how we make it happen. I, although I love independent bookstores that have classifications that I've never heard of, you know, like the one near my house has a section called plotless fiction. Oh, oh, um, <laughs> What's the name of the shop and where do you live now? I live in Toronto, Canada. The shop is on Queen Street West. It's called Type Bookstores. The bookseller, uh, Kyle, is supposed to come on, but he refuses to give me his third and final book. His first two are both in the plotless fiction category, which he created and loves. They're all books that don't really go anywhere, but are just fun to read. That was a very worthwhile shout out to the bookshop. Well done. Um, I see where you're coming from. Uh, and yes, genre is is a helpful signpost, but uh, a signpost is not the place it's pointing to. It's only a signpost, mm-hmm. and yeah, now and then they're useful. But um, I think possibly the problems might be overstated. Um, we do have booksellers, we do have podcasts, we have friends who read. Just, just. Um, Keep your ear to the ground and trust the advice of your local independent books and uh, bricks and mortar booksellers of the kind that actually pay tax and and have a role in the community. Um, go to the booksellers there, speak with them, uh, tell them the kind of thing that works for you, sort of the books you like, and and befriend one or two of them and mm. go back and tell them what you thought of their last recommendation if you liked it a lot or if it didn't quite work for you and i think this is how you do it uh with with this kind of um 
um, I'm not saying a prejudice, that's, that's too strong a word, but, 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 but with this lack of, maybe I am saying prejudice, uh, in its kindest sense, in um, the lack of prejudgment, then I think there's not so much of a problem, really. Um, mm-hmm. just, just befriend booksellers. Befriend yeah, booksellers one of our today, exact- yeah, listeners. Exactly. Well, one of our values on three books is, first of all, in an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. And another Mm -hmm. value on our show is um, booksellers are doctors of the mind. Chapter four of three books, we had Sarah Ramsey, my favorite bookseller in the world, uh, who after my divorce, like was helping me process it through literature. Mm -hmm. Chapter 44, we had Kevin, the bookseller, an incredibly interesting guy who threw the Lord of the Rings trilogy onto our list. And David, your next quote here that I want to kind of keep leaning forward in is, from Number Nine Dream, your book, a, a book you finish reading is not the same book it was before you read it. Oh, what did I mean by that? Um, a book, a book you finish reading is not the same book. Well, I suppose initially, maybe the most immediate interpretation is there's this thing on your bookshelf, and maybe you bought it because you heard it was good, maybe it was an unwanted gift, uh, but it sits there. Maybe you're from a background where you don't move them on, you don't get rid of them um, without giving them a go at least. So it sits there for days or weeks or years or decades in my case sometimes, and you never get around to it for one reason or another, but then one day you do, and maybe it works for you, and maybe it occupies you and you occupy it and then you get to the end of it and then obviously it's not this anonymous object anymore it's it's you've unpacked it you've let it do its magic on you uh and and inside it you have stored who you were as you were reading it uh you have a connection with that book now and you always will uh that edition but also every other edition of that book you ever encounter for the rest of your life, it, w- it, w- it will go from being the vast, infinitely large majority of books that you have not read. And it's now in the tiny minority of books that you have read. And that makes it pretty special. So it's not the same reason. So it's not the same book for that reason. Um, and maybe from, from the book's point of view, if we think of a book as a sentient being, uh, the book is... It's 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 not pure driven snow which no human mind has ever passed over, left prints on. It's now got your DNA in it, literally, if it went to a forensics lab. Um, but it's got your mental marks on it. Maybe it's got uh, a, a ring from your mug of tea on it. And, um, yeah. It's well. It's now a used book, but all books want to be used. If I was a book, I'd want to be used. I just want. I wouldn't want to sit there forever, like a, you know, a, 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 a some beautiful cherry tree in the middle of a trackless forest that no one ever goes to. I would like to be kind of admired. I'd like to hear someone say, "What an amazing tree! Look at that tree. It's so gorgeous." And I'd sort of preen myself a bit and say, "Yes, yes, I am rather attractive. I agree with you." And if I was a book, I'd feel the same. Uh now maybe that's what I meant. But number nine dream was a long time ago. <laughs> well, I love where you went with it and it it touches on what I thought I felt in other quotes by you that there's this aliveness to books because you said inside it you have stored who you are when you were reading it. And and the point about DNA is so interesting. You also said, um, the book will be what the book wants to be. You have said a half-read book is a half-finished love affair. And you have said, and I'll stop on this one for your for your, for your reflection, <laughs> books don't offer real escape, but they can stop a mind scratching itself raw. Books don't offer real escape, but they can stop a mind scratching itself raw. Okay, uh, I think I do remember that one. Uh, that was me saying, or me maybe examining the the oft said statement maybe said so often it's a truism uh that a book is an escape hatch it, it, it's 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 a magic wardrobe into uh into narnia but all books are those magic wardrobes whether or not the kind of 
there's a Narnia on the other side of it. There is a world on the other side of the book that you go into that is not the world you are in when it's not the same world as the room that you are in when you're reading it. However, uh, that's true and it isn't. Uh, it is true. It takes you away from, from 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 the place you're in for a while and it stops you maybe thinking about most of your problems, maybe not the the heavyweight things that life will throw at you sometimes, not the super heavyweight things that throw uh, that it throws at you. Sometimes you can't read. Sometimes you're too preoccupied by a problem that it, that, that that magic, it's just not working for you. Um, and maybe it's good to, as we say these days, own that fact that, uh, that actually it would be nice if a book always was uh, fail safe, guaranteed to work, magic wardrobe but unfortunately it can't be and you come back and you might be slightly changed but maybe you're but it's unlikely that this uh yeah, the book isn't a cure-all uh you won't come back with 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 the answer to your to the dilemma that you went into the book perhaps to earn an hour of escapism from um However, so I'm swinging one way and the other here, and I will. It's beautiful. I, I I'm really enjoying <laughs> listening to your mind. So don't don't hedge it. I want I want this is where we want to go on the show. This is the last swing of the pendulum. Uh, <laughs> it is still worth it. You do come back a little bit changed. You come back a little bit refreshed. You come back if you've been able to even half forget your problems for a little while. You come back, and there is hope that you will be seeing your problem from a slightly different perspective. Maybe you have a little bit more of a sense of proportion. Maybe, maybe the book has reminded you that, um, yeah, your problems are big, but you, but, but they're not yours alone. That that the other people have been where you are now, and they've they've come out of it the other side, and you don't have to scratch yourself raw. Over. <laughs> yeah and beautiful and a great little contextual landscape that you've created with your riffs on books david thank you as we lean into your three most formative books i would pause i'm going to pause for about 30 seconds on each book to introduce it to our listener i want the listener to feel like they are holding the book in a bookshop an independent bookshop that pays taxes uh, and is part of the community and then i will say to you Please tell us about your relationship with the book, and I have some follow-up questions after that for each one. Does great. that sound good? It sounds great. Okay. Okay, so your first most formative book is A Wizard of Earthsea. That's E-A-R-T-H-S-E-A -E by Earthsea. Ursula um, I, Earth I, 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 hope, I hope you'll forgive the interjection. It's, it's just The Wizard of Earthsea. No, I not only forgive the interjection, I welcome it. And uh, if I wasn't brown, my face would be red. Um, <laughs> but because I don't blush, I can't blush. There's no blushing allowed on my skin color. Mate, go from the top and the world will never know. So... Oh, no, no. I like the, my listeners know that this guy, the host, mispronounces like 12 words an episode. So it's okay. okay. But we'll go. Okay. A Wizard of Earthsea. A Wizard of Earthsea. I'm Warts and All by Ursula K. Le Guin. I hope I got that right. The yes. last name is L E space G U I N. She lived from 1929 to 2018. This is a quote unquote fantasy novel published in 1968 by Parnassus Press. The cover, and there are many, but the cover, the one I'm looking at, is a castle on a rocky cliffside with the big bold Ursula K. Le Guin pasted across the top and a wizard of Earthsea pasted across the bottom. The story is Ged, the great sorcerer in all of Earthsea, was called Sparrowhawk in his reckless youth. Hungry for power and knowledge, Sparrowhawk tampered with long-held secrets and loosed a terrible shadow upon the world. This is the tale of his testing, how he mastered the mighty words of power, tamed an ancient dragon, and crossed death's threshold to restore the balance. Dewey Decimal Heads, you can file this under FIC for young adult fiction. It is the second Ursula Le Guin book on our top 1,000 after number 910 the left hand of darkness from chapter 31 with juniper fitzgerald this is a wither of earth a wizard of earthsea by ursula k Le Guin. and david please tell us about your relationship with the book well when i read it first i was probably about eight years old nine years old maybe 10 but no older 
and I read it in pretty much the terms of that blurb that uh, you ah, – that sounds uh, disrespectful. Um, uh, what you read was a fair description from the back of a jacket that someone who gave the book, a, I think, a superficial reading would have – come up with but no disrespect at all to you Neil um this is uh, actually it ties in perfectly to what we were discussing just now about genre uh that is a description of a fantasy novel uh and it is identifiable as such because of the tropes that you identify uh or, or that the blurb identifies uh yes there are wizards yes there are dragons uh yes there is magic but it is so 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 much more than all of that it's a work of art that uses the stage props of a young adult fantasy novel before those words existed, um, but does something so much more with them. It, 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 it is an examination of the human condition. It is a kind of a map of the mind and soul. Um, it's steeped in Jung. It's steeped in a Taoism. Uh, it is beautifully written. And... Uh, I'm just very, very keen that your listeners don't slightly switch off and think that it's a proto Game of Thrones. Uh, not knocking that either, but this really is art. Uh, I'm wondering, Neil, I've just got a page open to a short scene here. If I could, oh, uh, yes. Would you mind if I gave a short reading? And I want to hear you talk more than anything. Go, well, please. Thank you. Uh, Ged, the protagonist, uh, arrives at a school for wizards. And it's not like Harry Potter. It goes like this. This is the school, the old man said mildly. I am the doorkeeper. Enter if you can. Ged stepped forward. It seemed to him that he had passed through the doorway, yet he stood outside on the pavement where he had stood before. Once more, he stepped forward, and once more he remained standing outside the door. The doorkeeper, inside, watched him with mild eyes. Ged was not so much baffled as angry, but this seemed like a further mockery to him. With loud voice and hand, he made the opening spell which his aunt had taught him long ago. It was the prize among all her stock of spells, and he wove it well now. But it was only a witch's charm, and the power that held this doorway was not moved at all. When that failed, Ged stood a long while there on the pavement. At last he looked at the old man who waited inside. I cannot enter, he said unwillingly, unless you help me. The doorkeeper answered, say your name. Then again, Ged stood still a a while, for a man never speaks his own name aloud until more than his life's safety is at stake. I am Ged, he said aloud. Stepping forward, then he entered the open doorway. Yet it seemed to him that though the light was behind him, a shadow followed him in at his heels. He saw also as he turned that the doorway through which he had come was not plain wood as he had thought, but ivory without joint or seam. It was cut, as he knew later, from a tooth of the great dragon. The door that the old man closed behind him was a polished horn, through which the sunlight shone dimly, and on its inner face was carved the thousand-leafed tree. Welcome to this house, lad, the doorkeeper said, and without saying more, led him through halls and corridors to an open court far inside the walls of the building. The court was partly paved with stone, but was roofless, and on a grass plot a fountain played under young trees in the sunlight. There Ged waited alone some while. He stood still, and his heart beat hard, for it seemed to him that he felt presences and powers at work and seen about him here, and he knew that this place was built not only of stone, but of magic stronger than stone. He stood in the innermost room of the House of the Wise, and it was open to the sky. Then, suddenly, he was aware of a man clothed in white, who watched him through the falling water of the fountain. As their eyes met, a bird sang aloud in the branches of the tree. In that moment, Ged understood the singing of the bird and the language of the water falling in the basin of the fountain and the shape of the clouds and the beginning and end of the wind that stirred the leaves. 
it seemed to him that he himself was a word spoken by the sunlight. Then that moment passed and he and the world were as before, or almost as before. I closed the book with an imposing... Oh, with an imposing. Oh, it's, it's pretty great, isn't that it? Was, oh, it was... I mean, it's better. Than, it's beautiful. It, it's you, I can let my mind just fall into the scene and feel like I'm there. Um, it's, it's you a, know, this is the quality of the prose, yeah. I mean, it's poetry. Um, and it's character and structure. Also, but yeah, you, you wrote in The Guardian. Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. Uh, no, no, uh, I, I was just a super quick point. Tolkien was a great world builder, but he never did that. He just couldn't write like that. Uh, that is uh, 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 at her fr- frequent finest, Le Guin is a poet, pure and simple. Over. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, it needed. Uh, but you also wrote in the Guardian. Uh, you know, in, in an introduction, you wrote for an updated version of the book, which you published in the paper as well. It says not to be- you wrote not to belittle Th's, Th White's, Tolkien's, or Susan Cooper's wizards. Never belittle a wizard of any stripe, but they are variants on the archetype of Merlin, a Caucasian scholarly aristocrat among sorcerers who appears fully formed and with little room for character development where the Merlins reveal themselves layer by layer, Ged grows. And the question I have on this, David, is, you know, Le Guin takes risks in her writing. The, the wizard is, of course, a very unusual character compared to what you're talking about. And, and you do as well in, in the structures of your book and, you know, the multiverse that you have created in your books with characters appearing in different forms and different books. Uh, my question is around that trust. Um, you've earned a ton of it. I, I know that even just by the letter that accompanied the arc of the book I got where the publisher of Random House says, you know, we didn't know what the book was about or when it was coming. We just couldn't wait for it, basically, is what the letter says. Um, how do you earn that trust? How far can you take it? How do you think about playing with that structure to the point where people can come with you? I know you're against snobbery, yet you ha- and this isn't uh, this isn't saying you, but your books have such original structures and formats and ideas in them. How do you think about building that trust with the reader as Le Guin has done? And how far do you push it? And how do you think about how far you can push it? Oh, I, I've, I started out with a long, oh, I have to buy time. Because the truth is, I, I, I don't think I really think of it, Neil. Um, it's, if the work's any good, people will read it. If they don't, they mm. won't. Um, maybe as I publish more and that sort of, also by uh, list at the beginning of the book gets a bit longer each time. Maybe that list gets longer, perhaps the trust gets a little bit. Um, I, I, I sort of have more trust dollars in my bank account to be spent on on, on uh, challenging openings, maybe. Um, but I don't think I've been... I mean, Cloud Atlas is a bit oddball, and maybe Number Nine Dream as well, but... but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and maybe at the beginning of Thousand Autumns, there were an awful lot of Japanese names to digest. Uh, but on the whole, compared to some writers I could mention, I, I don't think I'm, I'm that much of a jump into the deep end, am I? What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I've read our first 100 pages or side A, and I, I can feel myself slowing to savor already of Utopia Avenue. And what I notice is, yeah, on the face of it, David, you know, you're writing a story that I can follow and I know I can see the characters. Mm-hmm. At the same time, paragraph to paragraph, without chapter breaks, without structure breaks, I'm completely jumped to a different place, to a different scene, to a different... And I mentioned I'm a novice reader, but for me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I feel like I'm on a roller coaster with you, and that's partly what I'm talking about. And I have heard you say in the past, in a previous interview, you know, you can't write a book with one sentence, the theme introduced at the beginning, and 600 pages of the sentence ending at the end. You know, so you have to know the meta... I think you said the the sort of physical limits of a reader. But beyond that, you know, I heard you say, you know, you mentioned that... um, Cloud Atlas is a mirror image of of Colvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Mm. So there's something you're doing in a structure to me as a reader I'm not familiar with, but I'm engrossed by, I'm enthralled by. And I'm like, as a writer myself, I'm 
constantly seeking to challenge my own readers, but have not got anywhere near the distance or yardage you've come um, on that trust and change. So I'm, that's what I'm like, how does he do that? How does he know people will go with him there? Or how does he end up places where I couldn't have imagined it? You know, like, and I know Le Guin does that. And so I was curious, I know you don't do it purposely, sounds like, but there's something you're doing here. And I just wanted to poke at it a little bit. Um, but one, one answer that occurred to me when you were speaking, um, very eloquently just then, Neil, if I may say so, was that, um, you are familiar with the structure of Utopia Avenue. It's just maybe you're a bit less familiar with seeing it in a book. It's essentially a Netflix show, uh, now it's not written to be a Netflix show. It, it's it's not written to be a, a, ser- um, a series made of seasons. You know, it, it's um, uh, made of episodes. But as it happens, uh, if you watch Breaking Bad or something, that also jumps about in time and space. That also ends one scene in one location and then immediately goes to another one, uh, and then immediately goes to another one. Um, the sh- the show uh, the box set as we're still kind of calling them even though in the physical form they don't exist anymore much um, the box set is a dominant artistic structure of our time uh, writers are readers but we're also watchers of TV shows um, many of us also work on TV shows uh, or, or or have um, sabbaticals in that world. Uh, and can you pa- pause for a second just to define sure. the phrase box set like what, uh, is, what do you sure. mean box set uh, uh, that must be a, a Britishism sorry uh, so a box set uh, 15 years ago would have or 13 years ago would have been um, um, what you bought when you bought the wire uh, a box okay 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 movie. that is this no that is the same phrase <laughs> i just couldn't i just couldn't i do know what that is but oh, i yeah. didn't know that the, the i didn't know that was i wasn't picturing that into a structure but i see what you mean sure this encapsulated sort of solid series that has yeah that has movement through it and jumps all over the place to get there a giant narrative made of seasons the same way that uh okay. and and, and in 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 a beautiful roundabout way, it 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 it, it also comes from the nineteenth century novel, which famously was also a giant narrative, not broadcast on TV weekly because it hadn't been invented yet, but uh, printed weekly or fortnightly or monthly in magazines, uh, and there'd be a, a new instalment, and they would have to bear in mind um, the. Uh, the frailty of the human memory and uh, repeat, remind reader who such and such a character was because it might have been uh, two thirds of a year since uh, the character was last on the page in the same way that um, previously on Breaking Bad, uh, they Mm -hmm. give reminders of, 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 that they, they, they equip you with what you'll need to know to make sense of what can be a, byzantine plot um game of thrones would be a, an, an, an even more obvious example um so where are we going with this i'm going to suggest that um you are used to narratives like utopia avenue which is maybe you're less used to seeing them um transplanted or graft or maybe you're less used to seeing a novel um sort of superimposed or and maybe you could speak to the the multiverse element here, like you know the idea that there's a character in Utopia Avenue with the last name that from a previous book of yours. Like there's something else happening with. I mean, the top question on Goodreads right now on Utopia Avenue is: Will this book be set in in Mitchell's multiverse? That's the top voted question, and oh. all the answers are: I hope so. It looks like it with the title. I found this Easter egg on page four, oh, and like everyone's gushing about this idea that your characters, and for those that don't know, they appear in other books in other f- sort of fleshes in a sense. I'm, that's something that I'm also haven't seen really before. You know, I guess it's like a cameo in the wire, but I don't, you know, I don't know what else to compare it to. Um, well, um, it's still a box set principle. It's just, it's one degree of magnification up. So my, 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 my sort of oeuvre, uh, 
the sum total of everything I write is also a box set. So it's not just the individual novels like Utopia Avenue, which is kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, one standalone box set, which it is, and you can make sense of it, I hope, if you've never read anything else I've written, and if after reading it you decide to never read anything else I've written again, uh, it should still work on its own. However, if it so happens that you've read other things I've read, then um, you'll see that it's one box set in a series of box sets that make up um, everything I've ever written and will write before I die. I mean, the answers to those good read readers uh is is yes uh and everything i do will fit somewhere into um the the overall universe even if there aren't any links yet at some point in the future there'll be a link back to it and 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 that principle will apply to even short things i write of just a few pages long um so so it's a yes to that um if I answered the question, I've... yes, you have. But there's and there's. I want to keep pushing on a different topic here. Imagination comes out when you did that reading from the book. You know, we can mentally transport ourselves, and that happens to me in all books of yours that I read. I feel like I actually am somewhere else, and I don't feel that way with many books. There's a dense, layered, complex level of imagination that makes me really feel like I'm there. Is there? anything you were doing uh to to plunder and penetrate the depths of your imagination david like i'm curious like I, I, you are doing that so well for for us the, the sort of layman out here how do we learn to harvest our imaginations a little bit better as a just a general life skill from someone you know who's doing that so nicely in your books how do you think about imagination as as i don't know want to apply the harvesting metaphor on you but that's how i'm thinking about it and i'm curious how you harvest yours um your question is eight miles high neil um that i'll struggle to do much justice to in an answer of one or two hundred words but uh, i would say we do it already it's just it's more obvious that i'm doing it because i do it for a living and um ultimately i uh i don't get paid i lose the house and my children starve if uh, if I don't do it well enough. So that's quite an incentivizer there. Um, I'm being slightly flippant, but slightly not as well. Um, I, 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 you just make a scene, um, which has two meanings, of course. Uh, in the artistic sense, you make a scene. You work out where it is set and who is in it. And you don't listen to diversionary tactics that pull you in a different direction and and suggest you go and make the 26th slice of toast that day. No, you sit down and you write the scene and it doesn't matter if it's no good. It's not going to be any good the first time and just write it. You can't improve nothing, but you can improve something once it's there. So the first run through, the second run through, the third run through the scene, you're not expecting excellence, you're just expecting something. And from that... Um, I think the harvesting that you're alluding to sort of happens. Uh, it's not quite the metaphor I'd go for, but I'm not quite sure what metaphor I'd replace it with. Um, well, the only other one I've heard you mention in a previous interview is you go looking, this is you, you go looking for them and you stay open for them when they walk in. Uh, those are characters. Those are, yeah, yeah. Um, but my, I, what I wrote in my little notes here was, how do you do that? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> but that was just me trying to, I guess, me being flippant. I'm like, but that's not where I, like, how do you do? But yeah, I know, you know, so maybe it's because you're you. Um, um, but um, I understand what you mean on that. It's just, but, you just do it. Uh, but you do it too, Neil. I mean, if you um, meet. For a f uh, if you meet a friend for a drink and they say, um, so what's been happening lately? And there's a story and there's something that matters to you and there's something you've been through. And you, on the spot, without even knowing you're doing it, well, you are knowing you're doing it, but 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 you don't think of it in terms, uh, in you don't think of it as anything related to what I do for a living and to what we're discussing here, but you will tell a story. Uh, mm. It's in the past. It happened. All you have to do, all you have to use, oh, the only tools at your disposal are language. And hey, guess mm -hmm. what? They're the only tools that I have at my disposal too. Now I'm writing it down. I can hone. I can polish. I can refine. I can shift weight and emphasis. But it's still language. And you're doing it. 
uh, using the language you have and you build sentences that are broadly grammatically coherent uh, and and you put the people you need to put in the scene they're there and you report, use reported speech you say you, you you include who said what to whom and when and in what order and you you think about how it is sounding to your listener in the same way I think about how this might be coming over to my reader. Do you want them to laugh at this point? Are they supposed to cry at this point? Uh, are they supposed to get indignant and furious on and, and furious on your behalf at this point? Are you deliberately trying to piss them off at this point? Uh, you're constructing a story. You're constructing a narrative. Um, now, the use we put these narratives to are different. Uh, I build them up in layers and, and 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 for hundreds of for sequences of hundreds of pages and the same way a cellist can play more than one string at the same time with one stroke of the bow or try to make scenes do more than one thing or lines do more than one thing at the same time nonetheless it's just narrative and that's what you're doing as well um so this isn't kind of a uh, or maybe it is um maybe it isn't a fancy way of turning your question back to yourself, but I'd just like to suggest that it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a bit like genre, kind of the mystery of what I do is only really there if you think it's a mystery, if you just recognise it's a somewhat more convoluted version of what every sentient, verbal or conversant human being does anyway. Um, and even if they're not verbal, they'd be doing it in their own minds, uh, then we couldn't think without imagination. It just wouldn't work. We couldn't imagine the consequences of doing this and this and this. We couldn't um, retrieve the past and hold it and look at it all at once in the form of a narrative we think in narrative. And uh, that, I guess, is where I kind of run out of steam, but I hope I did some kind of justice to your question. More than justice, you made it real and you made it accessible for people listening. A lot of our listeners are writers or aspiring writers. It's wonderful to hear that it's doable for those of us who are trying to construct a scene or work on things like that. And in we're already case, doing it. If, if it would just jump in once more, then here's a practical tip. Just think about the five senses uh, in a scene. I mean, this is a classic creative writing workshop thing, I know, but it it, it is a classic because it works. Just think about how things are looking, which we do anyway, sure, but also how things are sounding, how things are feeling, how things are smelling, and if food is involved, how things are tasting. It might just be the air. Um, and, um, and especially if it's a somewhat, if it's, if it's a scene which would be some distance from your anticipated reader's uh, time and place, then maybe put in, say, three things that only someone in that world would know. Now, you've got to find mm. these out. I call these things IWASTHS. It's an acronym of, of, of I was there just because I needed a word and I couldn't find one. So I... Sorry, I-W-T? I I-W-A-T-H, an IWASTH. Ah, now, I was there. I was yeah. there. I, okay, gotcha, IWASTH. So an IWASTH is, 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 is a fact, a piece of information, a sensation, um a uh, snatch of dialogue even that only someone deeply in that world deeply in the world you're describing could know it's not the gonna it's not the sort of thing that you're gonna run across on your first visit to the wikipedia page uh, it's deeper than that and you harvest them that is the metaphor you say you harvest them from memoirs or from conversations with people who are in that world or from biographies um or from yeah just from experience from life um, Can you give an example of what you mean by that? Okay. Um, I lived in the Netherlands for a short time, say, 60, maybe 15 years ago when I was writing Jacob de Zoot, and I got caught in a snowstorm on a polder, uh, like a, a big flat field that used to be a marsh. And the snow was so flurry some if that's a word it it, it 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 whirled and billowed and, and 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 went up and down and penetrated absolutely everywhere that despite the elasticated wrists on my coat as i was cycling along on a bicycle somehow 
a snowflake found its way up into my armpit and melted there. Now that is an <laughs> eye wash. That's an oh eye wash about Dutch weather. And every Dutch person, yep, 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 that's what, that's what happens, that's it. Uh, however well protected your armpit is, somehow if you're caught out in the snow in the Netherlands, there's nowhere to hide, a snowflake will get into your armpit and you'll feel it melt and your armpit's hot and it is just a moment of cold. So now you can't make that up. You can't say, sort of mm, I wonder what it's like to be in um, a Dutch snowstorm. You, 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 you have to have been there. So that's an eyewath about that. An eyewath say about music is that um, a guitarist will know that a key, the tool of the trade is it's not just the strength of your fingers, it's the condition of the calluses on the fingers that are plucking, especially if it's uh, a steel string guitar or, or, or a, a, a banjo player would know that. So these are crucial tools of the trade. It's the scabs on your fingertips. They know mm. it's something they know. It's something that's obvious when you start learning. But and but if you but if you're an outsider, you're not going to really think of them. Uh, in quite that sense, in 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 that way, I think so. That's a that's an example of an eye that's somewhere in Utopia Avenue in the new book. Beautiful. Um, last thing I want to get your reflection on before we move to the next book. In mm. 2014, at the National Book Awards, uh, Ursula Le Guin said, "This is a quote from her: Authors have to resist letting commodity profiteers sell us like deodorant and tell us what to publish, what to write." Mm. I get the sense you do whatever you want to do when it comes to your writing. Um, as I mentioned in the opening letter on the, the advance, it's like we didn't know what it was. You know, we knew at high level what it was about. How do you think about that quote? Uh, do you think the book industry is ripe with with commercialization? How do you think about commercialization uh, or not? And then in there, you know, to get to the place where your your publisher is sort of like, well, the next book he writes, we're probably you know we're probably how do you see the machinations machinations i don't know if the right word of like a strong writer editor relationship looking you know um i can only speak for myself really i mean uh broadly i certainly agree with ursula and well specifically i agree with ursula she was uh speaking about a time when a copyright was being violated en masse by uh, a certain well-known digital platform and books without an author's say-so were being um, digitalized. And, and, and if, well, that's what a land grab looks like. Um, mm. And so it was about a specific event. Um, uh, it is also so that's true. It is also true that a degree. So I know we we happily trash Amazon on the show, so don't be afraid to. <laughs> uh, I will preserve my diplomatic demeanor uh, for for the length of this uh, for the length of this interview, Neil. But uh, but 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 I've uh, I, I I hope my remark about the importance of bricks and mortar bookshops did not go unnoticed either. Um. It's also true that a um, that a publishing industry with a sophisticated uh, marketing department and sales force enables more writers to be a, to be able to earn a, a better living, and I'm in favour of that as well. So we have two slightly opposite things that are also true here. Um, where else did your question go? It was a multi-pronged. Fork. The the uh, the uh, oh, and I throw these at you because you can take them wherever you want, which you're so beautifully doing. The, the the trust you've built with your editor. How does a strong editor author relationship look like? How does that get manifested over time? Is it just like you know you produce some hits and now they let you give you a long leash, or <laughs> is there more to it than that? You need to speak to an editor, really. Uh, I, I've, I, I've, I've only ever had the same editors throughout the whole of my career, with one exception right at the beginning uh, of my UK goes for an editor left, but his uh, successor, the Camel Welsh, I've been with the whole time. Oh, uh, and there one or two changes at Random House as well. But uh, I've, I've certainly stayed with... Uh, the publishers and and the whole team. I'm I'm kind of happy there, and if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Um, 
I suppose there's there's an element in what you said. I've never won the booker, but I still think the booker has been very good to me. Uh, Shortlisting number nine dream gave me a bit of a carte blanche to do what I did with cloud Atlas and then happily it sold. And uh, that's given me uh, a a succession of carte blanches, which so far at least don't take anything for granted, but uh, have fortunately enabled me to complete, uh, to, continue the story um I, I, I just can't speak for anyone else um i i, I interviewed david sedaris for this podcast he said something oh, similar it was... he's so smart he's gonna make me look like a fool the moment you open your mouth here because he's so smart that guy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, uh, uh, he will not make you look like a fool. You are no fool. Um, but he, he said along those lines that he never experienced the opposite of commercial success. And as a result of that fortuitous, but he was plain about it experience of his crowds getting bigger and bigger and his book selling more and more. He now gets to, you know, it's just like, literally it's open. Now you get to do whatever you want. The only thing I have in there, it's kind of just and I'm, I'm feeling the I'm empathizing towards all the people who are writing books around the world is therefore, if you don't get a hit out the gate or, you know, it, your work doesn't find an audience early, then because I get asked this, too. My first book was a viral blog that turned into the Book of Awesome, which sold a million copies. My first book. Yay! I can't I can't Yay. answer the question, but I want to know the answer so I can happily answer it. I want to be able to answer this question. It's how do you do it? And, and it sounds like it's just either get ahead out of the gate or slowly, slowly, slowly build trust, which is a very hard slog, slog for, for the majority of. Yeah of people yeah. that's the pain point that i'm i'm trying to articulate because i know it's a pain point for many of our listeners too oh, i'd love to i'd love to be able to answer uh politics slightly comes into it and uh, and I, I i i hope i won't um kind of unintentionally tread on any toes by saying this but it does so happen that if you live in a country with a functional health service uh, compared to my american writer friends um, especially when kids come along, um, I think that, I think this makes a difference. Um, um, I do have to be careful. Um, no, I think. What am I hearing you say? If you know your kids are going to be taken care of when they're sick, you can take more risks in your writing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't sell as many books. It or, and or you don't have to uh, get. A, um, uh, a somewhat unstable creative writing professorship on the side so that uh, you don't have to pay retail for health insurance. Uh, I, I, even at a pretty high level, uh, most of my American writer friends have to teach as well. Uh, and they're already earning kind of from their books, but, um, but, but health insurance is so brutal in the States uh, that this is... This is a factor in the overall equation that European writers don't really have to think about very much, and I guess Canadian writers too. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, we have national health care, which I never quite articulated as an enabler, but you're right, it truly is. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a factor in the enabling equation, uh, and <laughs> m- maybe quite a strong one. Um, now, um, this still hasn't answered the question. Um, yeah. Um, and I can't answer it. Um, and I was right first time, David said, Alice did say what I'm floundering around much more eloquently in a tiny fraction of the words I've already expended on it. No, <laughs> but we love your words. Your words are beautiful. And by the way, just so listeners know how I do the word of the chapter at the end of every uh, chapter of three books, I, I, play a little word cloud if it warrants, which it will in this case. And then, I don't know if you know this, Dave, but we then pick a word of the chapter. We go into the deep etymology of it. And Ooh. and so far, look, look, I'm just telling, bibliophilia, a republic of letters, pigeonholing, a paint box, vestiges, uh, stage prop, we, the, don't preening, uh, don't apologize for the words. We are <laughs> loving them. Oh, and you. we will love them right into your second book with a drum Ooh. roll. I wonder if I can press this button here. Oh yeah, okay. That wasn't the well. There was a little button called drums right in my recording oh. studio. I was like, it was kind of the high, the high top. But imagine that was a drum roll. It yeah. is the duel. 
by Anton Chekhov, C H. E K O V. Did I pronounce any of those words wrong? Perfect. You pronounced it. To perfection. <laughs> Please don't hesitate to correct me. He lived from 1860 to 1904. This was a novella originally published published as serialized chapters, as you were mentioning earlier, David, in the Saint Petersburg newspaper Novoye Vremya, which I'm sure I mispronounced in 1891. This story was first published. In 1881, as a morality tale pitting a scientist, government worker, his mistress, a deacon, and a physician against one another in a verbal battle of wits and ethics that explodes into a violent contest. Oh, there are, go, there are go, many. Go, Neil. There are, yeah, there are many versions of the cover, but the one I'm holding is the 2003 Dover Thrift Edition with a cream oval in the center, pen and ink drawing of a man who looks like a Russian scholar with a long jacket and a goatee holding a large gun. Anton Chekhov was a Russian playwright and a short story writer considered amongst the greatest writers of short fiction in history and one of three seminal figures in the birth of modernism in the theater. He was also a practicing physician and said, medicine is my lawful wife and literature is my mistress. A good question. I love your show. It's so visual, and and the audio is great as well. It's 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 really rich. Um, it's it's um it's it's a, it's as much a night at the opera as it is a podcast. Good on you, sir. Oh, that's going to be a blurb on the front of our website before you know it. Um, <laughs> this one you can file an 891.73 for Russian fiction. Chekhov, of course, had written stories to earn money, but his artistic ambition grew. He made formal innovations, which have influenced the evolution of the modern short story. He made no apologies for the difficulties he posed to readers, insisting the role of an artist is to ask questions, not answer them. Mr. David Mitchell, tell us about your relationship with The Duel by Anton Chekhov. Well, it's all Chekhov, really, but you insisted that I chose one, and uh, and that's the longest thing he ever wrote. It, 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 it's, it's, he never managed a novel, and he didn't need to. It just wasn't his form, but he had a stab, and the duel happened. Uh, so it's a beefy novella, um, and it is beautiful, and it is... It's not a tightly coiled spring at the beginning. Uh, it's not The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. It's not Heart of Darkness by Conrad. It's It's got more space. It's got more air in it than those things which haven't got a cubic inch between them. Uh, fantastic. But uh, of the three, uh, my top favourite ever novella, I think, would be The Duel. Um, it's slowly... It's, it's a slow burner. Um, it 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 approaches. It points to it. it, it um, uh, says a word I'm after. Um, where you plot a trajectory. Uh, it'll come after. Uh, it'll come back afterwards. Um, no, there is a word. Plot plotting. When you plot a trajectory in mathematics, what are you doing? You are. Oh, a scale. Um, there is a word, isn't there? It's a uh, plot. When you plot a trajectory in mathematics. It's great when a uh, it's great when a word plays hide and seek with you like this. You have to go hunting through the thickets for it, and maybe it'll escape you this time. But maybe you get it. Uh, I think it's extrapolate. Yay! Ooh, Got it. nice, nice, nice. Oh, that was just about to go. Uh, th- you <laughs> saved it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, it's in in football terms, it was kind of it was a surefire shot that was. Bound from the back of the net, but I just about got my goalkeeper's glove to it and just twisted it around the top right corner of the crossbar. <laughs> I love that. And the crowd goes oh. wild, and the goalkeepers <laughs> are just screaming, "What a save! Can you believe what Mitchell did just then?" And 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 there'll be YouTube clips with EDM music it's going boom, 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 with uh, the same and repeat after repeat. <laughs> and someone got a snowflake or a bit of a hot dog bun in their armpit somehow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, sorry, back to the duel. Um, it extrapolates its ending uh, slowly and cleverly, and only after a while do the lines become clear. But then once it's on, you kind of hear the 1812 overture. No, uh, the... Um, uh, Romeo and Juliet overture just playing in the background because this duel's going to happen and combatants have 
back themselves into corners and there's no way out and you don't want it to happen and you don't want anyone to die and they're human because it's Chekhov and he is great. Uh, he, I mean, the only thing you said in your interesting introduction there, which I'll take issue with, um, it's, something, it's something he said, not that you said, but uh, makes no apologies for challenging the reader. Uh, uh, he certainly doesn't challenge me. He, he's... Yes, of course, you have to pay attention, but no more than you would for anything else written of his time and less than you have to pay attention for less expertly written prose, um, expertly written prose. He's great. Um, he doesn't do bad guys or good guys or women. Um, he, he writes women really well, uh, I am told by women. Uh, certainly for a man of his era, he, he's, he's, he's really at the front of the pack. Uh, he credits women with psychological intelligence, which at the end of the, at the, end of the 19th century, alas, not, not a whole bunch of writers were doing, of male writers ever did. Um, and it's, it's just it's beautiful. Did I mishear you, though? You said he doesn't do good guys or bad guys or women? Uh, it needed grammar that should have been there so that's my wart that's my uh wizard of earth seer right there it's um he doesn't do bad guys or good guys or bad women or good women he ah, just human gotcha. <laughs> yes he did <laughs> semicolon in there or, or 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 some piece of i just casually saved Wait. you from the me too movement <laughs> uh... <laughs> um, um and and the jewel's just a great example of all of this. I think what's crucial um, is that he was a doctor as well. I've got a pet theory that pretty much all the novelists I love, they're novelists and one other thing. And the further away from being a novel writer, uh, being a novelist or a writer, that other thing is, the more singular and the um, more unusual the flavours in the work and Primo Levi uh, the Italian writer was a chemist and not many great chemists great novelists around and and and, and his work is like no like nobody else's I mean he was also a holocaust survivor which brings a distinct flavor of its own nonetheless um nonetheless his background as a chemist informs his work being i mean uh, this isn't a writer we're talking about uh but um i know uh, that's uh off down another rabbit hole uh, i'll stop the subject no no i like no 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 i like i like it i and I, even today you know you think about someone like atul gawande who is a, a practicing physician yeah his books pop even uh you know you know a uh, a uh, 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 people that could be an ex police officer, or I think this probably is the nature of the love of biography, right? I mean, or memoir that we're getting a window into another idea somehow, and you're painting it like it happens without you knowing it, but feeling it when someone's done something else. Absolutely correct. Um, memoir, it's a part of the deal, and we're going into another person's job and life uh, and way of thinking. Uh, fiction, they write, then. It's not strictly the deal, but it's happening anyway. And when we read Chekhov, we are looking at narrative through a doctor's eye, We're looking at human beings through a doctor's eye. He saw it's, 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 it's amazing. He worked hard as a doctor. It kind of it wasn't a part time thing. It was a full on thing. And then at the end of the day, after a day of seeing sick dying worried anxious russians he would go home <laughs> in the 1800s write short stories that we're still reading and just knock them off in three hours and there'd be this beautiful thing that would then be published in a paper and he'd send the money to keep his family financially afloat uh he did well with the plays as well but uh, a remarkable guy and and it, but I, I just keep coming back to the medicine uh he 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 saw the body and the soul as as things susceptible to malaises and illnesses sometimes real sometimes very very not real indeed and and he saw the dysfunctionality of human beings relationship with death every single day all the time uh and it's there in his work and 
Uh, the Jewel is a beautiful example of this. Um, if you've got no problem with short stories, and most people don't, um, then there's so many. I don't know where to start, but Lady in a Lap Dog, uh, Lady with a Lap Dog. It's a beautiful thing, just about um, the winding down of uh, of a relationship that's past its expiry date, but neither of the partners are quite willing to face that because of the huge social stigma and then the blossoming of a new love uh and and just the 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 seismic upheaval that this is going to form even more in 19th century russian society of course uh compared to now um a beautiful story it's just amazing chekhov's great uh and the jewel is is his is him at his longest and finest Mm-hmm. Uh, I read it when you know, I was 20, 22, um, a little bit older. I read him in Japan, and, well, so it must have been 24. And I read that thing about every yeah, about every 10 years, which is about the same um, that I read Ursula Le Guin as well. And each time I find new things in his work, and each time um, it sort of glances off me at a different direction, and or embeds itself in me in a different place. He's it, it, just a great gift. So that's me on Anton Chekhov. Ta-da! Uh, it's, no, it's beautiful. And the medicine part, maybe, you know, there's this one reference on page 47 of this 92-page novella. Semolenko sat down and prescribed solution of quinine and kali bromati and tincture of rhubarb, tincture gentiane, Aqua Fonicella, all in one mixture, added some pink syrup to sweeten it and went away. And I just was what, like, whoa, like <laughs> uh, um, the world has changed and fascinating that that was just like thrown in as a little like prescription there. Uh, the, uh, the mention of the pink ingredient at the end, that's an eyewath. Oh, uh, yeah, totally. Everything else you could look up, but the pink yeah. thing to make it feel more like medicine. Uh, that's the eye Ah, uh, I've heard you talk about the Russians a lot, David. In an interview with the BBC um, years ago, you said, when someone asked you about your influence, you said, you said, you said, quote, the Russians, period, all of them, period. <laughs> and so I, I wanted you, uh, of all people, to please, for the uninitiated, and that's including me here, like, just can you give us just a quick overview? Who are the Russians? What are they known for? Who, what, which, why worth reading? And I know we'll get there. And and then, like, can you just help me with a little navigation tool? So, like, I'm a guy who has not read anything by the Russians except for this novella, which I read before this interview. Absolutely. Like to go in deeper. Can you hold my hand a little bit? Oh, What's the guided tell tour tell of this? How do you, how do you do it? I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm my, my, um, my knowledge is as deep as a piece of paper, but I'll do my best um, <laughs> since you put me on the spot here. Oh, that no, no, you really can't go wrong. If, 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 if they're from the 19th century, and in many cases from the 20th century, and they wrote in Russian and they're still in print, that they're in print for a really good reason. And as um, they are your professional ancestors, you know, um, you're, you're, you're a writer too. And um, I think you'd get it. I think just in this brief conversation and sensing slightly the way you think and your fondness of scale and and kind of the your fondness of the vertigo uh the vertiginous effect that fiction can have i think you would love them uh don't be scared of a told story i mean war and peace is a famously long book so is anna karenina but you they just they they fly by uh they are just so good um that there's you can't it's 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 a cliche for a reason that you can't put them down they are great and they're not deep intense things that are going to feel that are going to make you feel exhausted after reading them for a quarter of an hour after a quarter of an hour you think good god i'm on page 278 now it was 100 and something a minute ago you really go through them quickly because they're because they're so good um they are whole worlds they that they, they uh in 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 the history of the novel, sure, there were long novels beforehand, and 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 the English and the French were doing similar things around the same time. But but um, big sweeping epics, uh, just always always under control. Big sweeping epics that never that the author never lost control of. Uh, the Russians are great. Um, crime and punishment, uh, you'd love that. 
um, um, you'd love something a little shorter. That's Dostoevsky? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Apologies. Um, Pushkin you'd love. He, he's somewhere between the two. I mean, he's earlier, but uh, he just wrote these beautiful, really short novels, novellas, stories. Uh, they're, they're, in one sense, they're in a galaxy a long, long way away in sort of a long, long time ago, like whatever the introduction to Star Wars is. But the humans are so human. They're also last week and they're also next door. Um, mm. The tone is something, there's something Russian about it, sort of just, hmm. just, 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 just the tone, what? the sort of heavy overcast feel, not heavy to read and not depressing, but something always sort of pressing down on you. But that makes the diamonds brighter and sharper and beautiful things happen. Gogol's great. Um, How do you spell that? G-O-G-O-L. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, he, he had this quirky sense of humour. Um, he he knew his um, bureaucracies. Uh, he's got a great thing called The Nose, just about a guy who... who, who it's about a nose who walks around as a person um there's layers of metaphor and symbol uh and symbolism that, that are just delicious to impact uh, to unpack i'm going to give you one 20th century one however um just as a stepping stone between now and the 19th century if you haven't read the master and margarita by mikhail bulgakov so the master and Margarita. No, I have not. I have not. The only other Russian thing I've even read, I think, that I'm pro- as I plunder my my memory, is Lolita. Oh, great! Well, um, Russian slash American. I mean, of course, mm, right? Nabokov was Russian to his, his bone marrow, but but um, especially towards the end, he 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 really understood American society <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's. Um, what created this petri dish in the 19th century in Russia to create this l- literature like explosion? What was it? Do we know? I just, as a sense um, from a history, it's uh, I'm uh, you. There are so many academics um, within within the square mile that you're speaking to me from who can give you mm. a, a much <laughs> better answer than me. So I slightly hesitate. But um, education, uh, once a state decides that it's worth teaching its working class how to read serfs in the case of Russia or, or kind of industrial working class, industrial working classes in Europe, at least so they can service, uh, they said they're more useful cogs in the capitalist machine then yeah uh they need to be able to read and write and once they're reading and writing then uh some of them become readers and once they're becoming readers then there's an appetite for things to read and once that appetite exists then magazines come into play and industrial sized printing presses so there's a uh there's uh, there's a technological slash social slash political aspect to all of this as well um and no netflix exactly and yes it was kind of that was a netflix of the day um mm. there were no tvs but the appetite for large-scale narrative was still there I think that's a fascinating point um, um they didn't have netflix but they had printing presses and the ability to cheaply make magazines that your laborers could afford uh, certainly your lower middle classes. Um, books were still expensive, but cheaply printed magazines, they were uh, they were within the budgets of artisans and, uh, and of better off labourers. And then, of course, once the market is there, then writers start to write for that market. And that then in, that enables writers to be able to earn a living. And then the virtuous spiral kicks in and you start getting really long 19th century novels. 
And sticking on this theme of place for a second, because we're talking Russia here, there is a quote from the duel on page 40 with the main character, Levsky, which I may mispronounce. Um, and he and he says, and he is spending his second summer in this stinking little town because he would rather be first in a village than second in a town. And I thought, <laughs> that's interesting. David Mitchell, as I understand it, lives in a town of around 5,000 people-ish, I think, uh, in Ireland, in Cork County. And I know you previously lived in, 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 and worked from Japan. I just wondered... As if we could just play the Russian card forward a bit, do you think about your personal sense of place as an ingredient to your work, to your life? You mentioned the healthcare, but is place part of it for you, where you are? Probably the short answer is no, because I can and do write in different places. That's a portable thing. It's not... Yeah, I see where the question's coming from. I think different writers would give, would give you different answers. Um uh some writers are, are are so rooted to to their place it's it's hard to imagine dickens not being a londoner it's hard to imagine i mean he he did do the lecture circuit in the states that was starting to kick off in his lifetime but um but it's hard to imagine him deciding to go to switzerland for 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 a year and staying there and working on a novel there um especially a novel about london um, although even a novel about the Alps would, would it, it, it just kind of does not compute flashes in front of my, uh, on the screen of my mind when I think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but for me, yeah, um, I, I, I had, um, peripatetic, a nice word for your fertile word cloud there, uh, <laughs> leaning as a, uh, when I was younger. So I, wanted to travel quite a lot and I did um and I was beginning to write when I was doing that and so so I think I'm probably less a writer rooted to place and it's less true that my that I'm my well, what ability I have is grounded in a particular ground does that answer your question? It does but then why the small town Ireland particularly? Oh um well if you're not in Cork Dublin, Limerick, or Galway, then everywhere in Ireland is a small town. And Mm -hmm. actually, small town is shorthand for your nearest small town for many Mm -hmm. Irish people as well. So my nearest small town is is Clonakilty in West Cork. Uh, However, uh, I'm a few miles out, and uh, this is pretty normal uh, for Irish people. Most of us live in the middle of nowhere. there's so, so Aunt Chekhov wrote this book or this novel novella at age 31. Um, you were 35 when you wrote Cloud Atlas. Uh, mm-hmm. Ursula was 39 when she wrote the, the first Earth Sea book. Um, you have a couple quotes here. You said, Sometimes youth and inexperience can be an ally. Chekhov did not make it that far. He died at age 44, sadly. You also wrote, you also said, Lots of people write loads of stuff in the 30s and then it tails off. It is worth thinking about how to avoid that failure. I know you're in your 50s today as you release this incredible new book, uh, Utopia Avenue, but how do you think about the ripening or deepening of your craft kind of decade by decade? Well, thank you. Uh, I'd give myself a little bit of a rap on the knuckles for 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 that. It's it's just, yeah. I, I I don't think I'd say that these days. It's got a slight it's got a slight self congratulatory tone about it that I dislike. I think. Um, um, what I do think, however, is that well, I think it is true that more novels get published by people in their 30s than get published in their 50s and 60s and 70s. So maybe it behoves us to think a little bit about longevity in what we do. I think a part of it is to not repeat yourself, um, to not think, well, Cloud Hatless was a hit, so I'll give them more of that. Uh, Even at that age, uh, when I sound a bit cocky, to be honest, I would... And I may have a misquote. I'm just trying. No, I'm no, grabbing uh, stuff from a yeah, number no, of different um, places. I could be. It could be me. Uh, I wish it was a misquote. I fear it isn't. Um, I fear strongly uh, it isn't. I, I'm not 
beating myself up too much about this sort of we age and experience and 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 hopefully say slightly less stupid things as no no but there's something me- there's something meta about the idea that even you know, reflecting on the quote is part of what the quote is about true true and um yeah um and the internet makes sure that this is going to happen because it never forgets um i want to i've got a met i've got a metaphorical compost heap in my head and the compost heap is what we take material for books out of and when you are younger it is still very full because you haven't written anything yet or much yet and all your life's experiences are on it untouched untapped and there's going to be a lot of life experience on there chances are if you're young uh because chances are higher that you haven't been tied down yet uh that your responsibilities are fewer your commitments are fewer to how they'll be when you're an older person. Uh, so if you want to put everything you own in a backpack and go off for a year, then if you can get the money together, but not too much money, then you can do that. Uh, and loads of stuff goes on the compost heap in that year. Uh, now, once you start, once you've got a publishing deal and you've got your first novel out, uh, which you've been writing all your life in some form anyway. And then you've got a two-book deal, so you've got to, get, got to get the next book out in 18 months, and you don't yet know that, uh, or you don't feel able to make your publishers wait until they're ready, etc. cetera. Um, then you can drain your compost heap really pretty quickly. And I think that is where the temptation to repeat your last hit comes in. And that's what you want to avoid. And you now, for a long time, I've had kids and and and, and had a mortgage to pay, and and um, I was a lot less mobile. Um, so ways of replenishing my compost heap were reading and conversation, and trying to sharpen my perception. I mean, it's worth noting that Emily Dickinson never went anywhere. She scarcely left her town, and towards the end of her life, she hardly left her house uh yet she, yet you can still find infinity and eternity in her poems um so it's not just uh, and, and and it's equally true that you can have a platinum air mile card and fly all around <laughs> the world right. and still actually not see anything apart from uh expensive hotels um and you know what i'm trying to say um but never mind something like the bible or the quran or the vedas right like just even just I'm read. assuming people yeah. that wrote these things are in place <laughs> as opposed to moving. Um, um, uh, that's, that's uh, the, the authorship of those works is another rabbit hole. And that one, um, in the case of one of those religions, let's really not go down that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the Bible, of course, is uh, written by many people in many places, um, unless you're a believer, in which case you believe that the Holy Spirit was the author at, uh, at, at each and every writing session however uh let's um put a manhole cover over that um rabbit hole uh, the point i wanted to make was um the other way that i've tried to replenish my compost heap is by saying yes to projects that would take me out of my comfort zone to, to side projects to sabbaticals so working with composers to do a couple of operas working with filmmakers um or or people uh with screenwriters um to think about how other people think about narrative how, how related professions but distinct professions think differently about narrative and character development and plot construction this has been really good for me and i sort of view it as professional development it's also the excuse i tell myself when i binge play red dead redemption 2 for five hours on end uh <laughs> tell myself well it, I, i'm i'm learning about how the writers at rockstar sort of develop arthur morgan's character as i'm exploring frontier us in the 1890s here um, hey uh the ceo of shopify a hundred billion dollar canadian tech star uh the ceo toby lucka goes on twitter and says i will personally cover the expenses of any video game any of my employees wants to buy 
Whoa. Because Whoa. he believes it's that formative to the, their, their kind of work psyche as well, which, you know, That's search really, and reapply. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, uh, I'm a newcomer to this world. Um, I, I, I have a, a teenager in the, in, in the house at just the right age. And, uh, she, she, she's introduced me to the, uh, to, to this whole new form. Um, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a work of art. I'll, I'll kind of go on record as saying Another that. blurb, another blurb for, for somebody to take. <laughs> it is beautiful. In, uh, and, 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 um, it's, so you've talked, yeah, yeah no, no, you've talked about the metaphysical compost heap in your head, the idea that life experiences can be kind of plundered when they're most full, and the idea of saying yes to projects. Okay. These yeah. are two of the ingredients we've talked about in this, in this sort of larger theme of ripening as an author over time, and whether or not what you said exactly meant, you know, fits into what you think today, there is something to it. I think in, specifically you were talking about Remains of the Day, I believe, or the author of that hmm. in your oh, quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, a Japanese author or British author, I believe, that's written to into sixty seventies. He's British Japanese. Uh, he is somewhat older than me, though. Um, th th though um, I won't investigate the exact number too closely. Uh, he's great, uh, and and he's yeah, he's 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 something of a role model uh, artistically and in terms of his career. Um, he. He cultivates friendships with younger writers. He's not worried about. Um, he he, and he has no reason to feel threatened uh, by younger writers. Uh, he, he he's he, he seeks out conversation with 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 us, and I'm not the only one. Um, and. Um, uh, I, I, I have a personal interest here, which is making it a little bit hard to speak about him because he's a because um, he's a good friend, um, and some of the conversations we have are some of the most useful and formative of my life. I think um, I love him. Ishig because Ishiguro, Ishiguro, yeah. is that my saying right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I love his work, uh, and I love the trajectory of of his novels because he also uh, I. It's always unmistakably him. Uh, his voice is always his voice. Um, and he, his books are really different. Um, uh, his first two books are uh, set in Japan. Um, really good. Um, uh, an artist of the floating world, sort of in, in the art scene, um, up to during and, and after the war, and 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 then just when he was about to be pigeonholed as a British Japanese author who writes about Japan, he wrote a quintessentially British novel, *The Remains of the Day*, which won the Booker, uh, and uh, was uh, the basis of a film with Anthony Hopkins. Uh, fine performance from him about a butler, about um, a butler in the um, uh, in in in. A country house and the name of that huge tv show about uh the british country house is danton abbey uh then when he was starting to get pigeonholed as the butler guy he he, he did this 30s style hefty modernist novel called the unconsoled which is really good uh it's it, it is a bit hard oh, it's hard to read but it's uh it might require stamina uh and it sort of breaks physical laws it really divided the critics but 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 where some people vilified it many absolutely loved it and still think it's one of his best books if, if not his best book um uh, about a concert pianist in some unnamed middle european city that feels a bit like vienna but may or may not be slowly having a breakdown and as he breaks down the boundaries between past and present and and even the physical laws of the world about him start to melt away it's really great uh and then just as he was being pigeonholed as that guy he 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 wrote a he wrote a book about shanghai during the war uh it's got a detective element and and uh then after when we were orphans um 
Kazuo Ishiguro wrote Never Let Me Go, which is science fiction. It's set in an alternative reality where it's, it's, uh, the technology feels pretty 1950s, 1960s, except for cloning. And kids are cloned to provide organs for uh, ill non-clones. And it's about two or three of those clones that have read for that purpose. It's really good. And then in 2015, uh, he published The Buried Giant, uh, which is a kind of, it's a kind of a fantasy, a kind of a fable. It's got a political aspect. Uh, it's about many things. Um, but it's just, I'm really glad he's there as, as an eminent senior writer who's won not only the Booker but the Nobel, uh, who can, sh- he, he sort of, his working life is living proof that you can do what I hoped was possible, which is to write a sequence of radically different books, uh, drawing on different genre, and they're all really good, and, and he's successful. So I'm just really glad he exists uh, for professional and- purposes as well as personal purposes. And- <laughs> Beautiful, professional and personal. And it ties into something I deeply believe, which is never retire. You know, Bill Sapphire was the famous op ed columnist and on language columnist at the New York Times for many years. When he retired, he had a great uh, essay and op ed in the New York Times. He wrote, and the title was, When You're Through Changing, You're Through. And up yeah. until he died, till the day he died, he took on chairman of the Dana Foundation. He took on like a, a, a totally different work while constantly writing. And it seemed like writing, to your early point, was an output of the other stuff he did and enabling, again, that model I live my life by, which is never stop. Um, I'm just writing that in the quotes page of my current notebook then, Neil. When you're through changing, you're through. And who's in Yes, and, and I, I can – it's Bill Sapphire, S-A-F-I-R-E. To get the rights to use it, I had to write a handwritten letter to his 90-something-year-old widow, and she wrote me – and I was willing to pay for it. New York Times said three dollars $4,000 to use it in Whoa. my book, The Happiness Equation. She wrote back and said – I would love for you to use it. Please don't pay me a cent. Bill would love that that message is getting spread. Oh, what a decent human being. Is it? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. And really I, cool. I will email you the, uh, I can email you the entire op-ed. Uh, <laughs> it's called When You're Through Changing You're Through by Bill Sapphire, S-A-F-I-R-E. He wrote a very famous column in the New York Times Magazine for years called On Language, where he picked apart for an essay a week, one word in the English language. Incredibly wow. masterful writer. Wow. Um, I love yes. etymology. Isn't it great? Um, what I learned this week was that the word crisis comes from Hippocratic medicine from ancient Greece. And a crisis originally was the point in the trajectory, which is the third time I've used that in this interview, the trajectory <laughs> of an illness. And it is the point in the illness where either the patient will... Uh, the condition will continue to worsen and the patient will die or the recovery sets in and the patient will at some point be put about again. And that point, that no turning back point, that's, that's a crisis. Isn't that cool? It's very cool. It reminds, you know, because that's when I do the word of the chapter, it's exactly what we're doing. Like the crisis example is great. Uh, did you know, here's one for you, David, tell me if you know this one, ostracized. Do you know the, the origin of the word I don't ostracized? Know. Uh, I ah. don't. But. Okay, so ostracized, and this is good for three books listeners. Those that have not listened to Chapter 13 with Ariel Bassett, one of the world's largest booktubers, will not know this yet. Um, but ostracon from Greek in the mid-17th century, O-S-T-R-A-K-O-N, was a shell or a pot shard on which names were written in voting to banish unpopular citizens. So if your name was written on the ostracon, which is again, part of a broken shell, they can't use the shell anymore. So they use it for writing. Then you were then forcibly ostracized (laughs) from the group because your name was written on the shell. And, Mm. um, Pariah, which is similar, was actually the drummer of the Sri Lankan marching band who was always at the very, very end of the parade. <laughs> um, my responses to that, I've got two. Uh, the Pariah one reminds me of one of my favorite uh, Marge Simpson quotes from The Simpsons. Um, there's, 
there now. There's no shame in being a pariah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I wonder if that was written by George Meyer, who we have been knocking on his door to get him on the show because those, those good those good Simpsons years were great, weren't they? Uh, I'm um, happy that I inspired that demonic cackle and the little <laughs> s- sonogram uh, on your voice just went mad when you laughed. That was so great. Uh, and Japanese for ostracism is murahachibu, which is the kanji, uh, the Chinese ideograms for village and apes or eight parts and boo is kind of a part so if only one eighth of the village were on your side was uh was on your side you were done for basically uh and so etymology in different languages is really cool as well and this is it's it's, it's kind of so right so kind of um it's so great to spend time studying other languages it's not only the ability to speak it but it's the the um um the access to the treasure chest of of, of wisdom and wit that's there in the etymologies of words oh uh, well the the accessing of etymologies of words through language interpretation and our the start of our conversation about the mind and memory are two beautiful segues into your third and final book, which Segway. is the <laughs> segue, <laughs> which is the reason I jump the inner voice of a fourteen year old boy with autism by Naoki Higashida, which I don't know if I pronounce right. Um, his, his last name is H I G A. S H I D A Higashida, and I apologize. It's the inner voice of a thirteen-year-old boy. Lots of not fourteen-year-old. Um, this is written by a very smart, very self-aware, very charming thirteen-year-old boy with autism. The reason that I jump is a one-of-a-kind book that demonstrates how an autistic mind thinks, feels, perceives, and responds in ways few of us can imagine. The cover is a young boy from behind in a blue checkered short sleeve dress shirt looking up at a sky full of abstract yellow and blue butterflies. Interestingly, the art was created by Kai and Sunny, who also did the wonderful Cloud Atlas cover, and who, by the way, David, told me to say hi, since we've been oh. chatting over Instagram, since oh, I've been telling them how much I love their art because yeah. of this. Oh, f- so yeah, cool. they say hi. They they oh, love you, yeah. as you know. Say hi back. Yeah, uh, and I might drop them an email afterwards. Um, that, that yeah. I love their work, and, uh, and 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 they really worked hard on 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 the reason I jumped. They did some internal art, especially for it as well. They they really understood it. Uh, they un- it was beautiful, and they wrote on that note inside the cover. Just just to finish, sorry, just to finish up is, is the New York Times bestseller burst is on there. The top blurb comes from John Stewart in my I guess American edition. It says one of the most remarkable books I've ever read. Dewey Decimal Heads. You can file this under six one six point eight for diseases of nervous system. And the bottom of the book it says, of course, in big font, introduction by David Mitchell, translated by K A Yoshida and David. Mitchell. So David, tell us about your relationship with The Reason I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13-Year-Old Boy with Autism by Naoki Higashida, born in so, 1992. This 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 is a story I've told a few times. Um, our son's autistic, and when he was three or four years old, that was sort of peak autism. Uh, it's rude to call it hell, but it kind of felt like that at times, if I'm honest. Um, but I certainly wouldn't describe it in those terms these days, in part because of the reason I jump. Um, what do you do when you've got an autistic kid? Well, one thing you do is you read books about autism to see how you can help. Uh, our son's particular type of autism means he's... Now, I use the word non-conversant. Other people are using the word pre-verbal. It's all fine. What it means is he he has language. He recognizes words and his listening vocabulary is really high both in english and in japanese uh, but he's never done what we're doing right now ever once this game of conversation i say something he says something back i say something he says something it, 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 his brain just is not wired that way um so um because of this when he was a lot younger things were really tough and he'd be having meltdowns several times a day, often pretty violent, never towards anyone else, but towards himself. And and I wish they had been towards me in some ways, because just kind of watching a kid headbang on the stone kitchen floor is just almost unbearable. Um, 
none of the books that we had were really helping with this. They were books either by, um, again, I dislike the word, but I'll use it for now, higher functioning autistic people uh, who could talk and had the neurological wherewithal to be writing books, or by parents, which is a very valid part of the autistic experience, but of course it's not from inside an autistic head, uh, by academics uh, who had studied autism for many years and and maybe were uh, genuinely helpful at a practical level as well, uh, or in some cases less so. None of these really helped, uh, and nothing really did help us until my wife, who happens to be from Japan, uh, stumbled upon this book by Naoki uh, Higashida, uh, written as a 13-year-old, so older than our son was, but not an adult, still within a kind of hailing distance of boyhood, and he writes about when he was a lot younger in that book as well. and. He was autistic, and he was non-conversant slash pre-verbal uh, and had never said a sentence in his life. How had he written it then? Well, he'd written it by tapping letters on a cardboard keyboard and a transcriber, usually his mum, writing these words down and or using a computer keyboard. Uh, the keyboard can be a bit distracting because um, there's another stage in Japanese where uh, you put in the letters, but uh, many uh, it, it, it's a it's a homonym rich language, uh, and um, there are many drop down menus when you use an um, when you're typing an East Asian language uh, on a QWERTY keyboard, as uh, many uh, as you and many of your listeners, I'm sure, will no doubt know. Uh, so mostly, uh, he, Naoki, wrote this book by dictating it by pointing two letters. So he points uh, the Japanese character on a sheet of card and articulates that letter and slowly builds up words like that. It isn't easy. Uh, he often loses his thread and has to come back to the beginning. But say... Uh, so my name is Naoki in Japanese would be Watashi no Namai wa Naoki desu. So to give you some idea of how he would spell that, he, he would do the wa and then the ta and then the shi. That gives you watashi from watashi not, which is like my. And then he might lose his thread and have to start again. Watashi no Namai, watashi no. Then, then he'd jump on to Namai, Namai, Watashi no Namai wa. Naoki des Owali. He hits the Owali square to say he's finished that sentence. And that is how he wrote the whole book. What's in the book? The book is made of uh, about 60, 70 questions about autism that he has heard a lot. Why do you do this? Why why can't you speak? Why why do autistic people uh, talk so loudly and weirdly yes that's a good one uh, i've got a copy of the book across the room so i'm trying to get it right now just give me a moment be right back why do you do things you shouldn't even when you've been told a million times not to why do you echo questions back at the asker why do you ask the same questions over and over just just while you're grabbing the book? And I love the sound of you moving a chair and getting like, that's beautiful <laughs> visual. No, I love that. Oh, thank um, you. Um, well, snowflake in the armpit. No, I feel that. And and just reading a few more questions for the for the listener. I just read well, three, four, do. and five. I've got, Portuguese, uh, I've got the Portuguese edition. <laughs> there in, there in um, it, uh, the book was, well, I'm jumping ahead here. Um, my wife and I, translated it uh and then it just went global it's 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 in more languages than i am it's in more language than any living japanese writer apart from haruki murakami it's it's in over 40 languages it's the appetite of this book was enormous uh anyway um i interrupted you where were we no you gave us a great overview of your relationship with it but take me a little bit more and since you have child three four banging his head on the gr on the ground oh, sure. pre-verbal yeah. non-verbal yeah. and then and, and if you don't mind interest and in, in, in sprinkling on here david just for, for yeah. the uninitiated like me just also if you don't mind 
like what is autism and and what is the state of autism you know as you as you tell the story here of your son sure uh i'll do my best um so uh the book was really helpful it was the only thing we found that was helpful it made us think about autism and our son entirely differently uh we were still sort of laboring under various well myths that are still around myths or just misperceptions or, or received or morsels of, of received thinking that that to some degree autism is still built or, or popular understanding of autism is still built from um for example um autistic people have no theory of mind that's one a theory of mind being that um other people are functioning sentient beings that can think for themselves and act accordingly uh and through to the through to the through to the nineties, through to the uh uh the twenty zeros, what do we call that decade? Uh the uh, the noughties, um through to the first decade of the of, of the century. It's ridiculous. That's the decade no one knows what to call. They still don't. The aughts, the yeah, yeah, I know. No one unless, knows that. Unless we're in the twenties and it has a proper name, but even the twenty teens, like what's the one we've just got oh, like isn't English rubbish sometimes? Like how poorly designed it's a basic thing my wife sometimes asks me this like like how can you get by with it? having this word it's so fundamental um, um anyway. my 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 uh wife came back from uh tanzania and she started saying pole all the time and i was like what's pole she said it means i'm sorry for you if you trip on a sidewalk if you if you if you're coughing uh you know we don't have a word in english that just means i'm sorry for what you're feeling they just say pole and I was like, wow, we need that word. And, you know, my parents, my parents are, you know, Indian. My dad's from Northern India. My mom is Indian by way of East Africa. Every single relationship in our family is defined. It's not just aunts and uncles, right? It's like brother's brother or, you know, father's brother is a word. Mother's sister is a word. Like, you know, I, you know, I have a buaji and I, everyone knows what that means. And it's like when I hear people here, which is me, I'm born here, I'm born in Canada, say, oh, my aunt. I'm like, on which side of the family? Whose brother is that? Is that a legal or in law? Like, I'm just like literally ask four clarifying questions to get to the word. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, I've, um, I've got a friend with an Indian wife in L- London and I've heard that one. And, and I think it is just lovely. Uh, it, it, it just sort of makes blood relations just much more special doesn't it and and marital relations as well um uh, even the relationship i've never i've always stumbled on this one baby uh uh, maybe you can give me a word david is like what so my parents and leslie's parents what's their relationship i wish i could help you i do not have a clue Right, because no. we share children that are married. Like we we share grandchildren. Maybe you know, like it's like, what is that? Anyway, um, English is rubbish. I agree. Sadly, it's all uh, I know. But you uh, know Japanese and translated this book. Uh, it's it's rubbish in some quarters, but it's brilliant in others. And all languages are. They've got uh, they've got Achilles' heels, and 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 they've got Achilles's fighting prowess as well. Uh, mm-hmm. um, strong, and, strong biceps in places. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 uh, they certainly do. Um, uh, we keep um, leaving. I mean, uh, no, your son, your son. You know, and you, you, you I was just because I've heard some interviews with you talking about this, David, and and I, and I and I love that you are open about the story of your son. What I haven't heard, and I guess what I'm kind of poking at a little bit is state of the relationship today and also state of autism today and and sure. what that even you know i don't i have a friend who's a single dad who's raising two autistic children right now um his daughter is nonverbal. i mm. i want to be a better empathetic friend take me into the just the world a little bit so i can be that person fine uh the first thing i would suggest is that you demonstrate by thought and act that your friend's kids can be as autistic as they wish they can have meltdowns on you and headbutt you if if it goes in that direction hopefully not but if it does then they can do that and you will not give a damn you don't mind you still like him like them 
even as they're headbutting you, and you're not going to care because you know it's the autism. It's not them. Uh, it's not even the autism. It's it, it's it's uh, it's it's the unbearability ness that autism is creating in them in that moment that is doing it but it's not them and if you show that to your friend and prove it and be the first one to wipe up the mess with whatever needs to be wipe it whatever the mess is you're there wiping it before your friend even has the chance that's how you be their friend and that's i think great uh um neil is an autism did, insider from that um, yeah go on well, I was just going to say, we did a Zoom call recently, the group of us, and I checked in late, you know, my high school friends, and there was screaming in the background, and I felt bad, because I said, what's that screaming? And he said, oh, it's my daughter. And I, I said, oh, great, you know, she's having fun. He said, yeah, I can I can ask her to go inside if you want. And I said, no, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. And so it's just like us navigating mm-hmm. that was what you're exactly you're talking about. Uh, your friends, uh, he'll know what you mean, and, 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 all, and all will be well. Um, I just want to go back to a big myth that the uh, – that the reason I jumped busted for us, which was also autistic people have no emotional intelligence. There's still there's still the sense that they're robots, that they're Vulcans in Star Trek terms. They just don't do emotions. Uh, and the beautiful gift, well, one of many in the reason I jump, um, is that that book can't be real if Naoki didn't have a a theory of mind. I mean, he writes short pieces of fiction in it, uh, short pieces of fiction which are taking into account the reader's responses at that time. And he was only thirteen. And there's there's a story at the end which is just beautiful, uh, and he has emotions because he talks about emotions, um, and and he. He answers the question you just asked me, and of how can we help him, and of what's useful and what isn't. Uh, he goes through this. Be patient with us. It'll take us a while to get there, but we want to get there too. One of the most poignant ones is what's the worst aspect about being autistic? And he says, it's not what you think it is. Uh, it's, it's not that I can't do this or I can't do that or I can't go there. It's that I know I am causing my mum and dad pain and awkwardness and embarrassment that's the worst aspect that's mm, just, just I, heartbreaking I, I can take everything else but that is just unbearable he says um it is heartbreaking and it's it, it, it is it, it is sort of a nuclear fusion sized blast of hope for mm. us because well if he's feeling that then he's not a robot <laughs> he clearly isn't and and that means that many of the things we think we know about autism are therefore wrong. Um, it comes down to this, that we are mistaking, and, and, and this answers your question about where we are with autism now. It's, it's a shift from this position um, that the communicative disability that autism is, is a cognitive one. Mm. Um, that we think because, say, our son, who's never answered... Uh, a question in his life he isn't answering it because he can't understand because of some cognitive impairment but no he can understand he has understood and when they can learn to spell or texticate or spell things out on 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 a keyboard like now kids learned to do they can speak and so we were wrong all along and we've been treating them as if they are less than human. And it's this that over the years, you know, imagine it, Neil, for how old are you now? I'm 40. Okay, so for for as long as your memory has existed, people have been talking to you like this. Mm. And for as long as people have been asking you questions, you haven't been able to answer them, not a single one, not verbally. Uh they and your education was spent just repeating the first year in kindergarten again and again and again and you had no education it didn't happen uh you learned what you were learning when you were five but because you couldn't say this is a square this is a circle seven plus two is nine because you couldn't do that people assume you 
couldn't do it. But it wasn't that you couldn't do it. It's just you couldn't you couldn't prove that you knew it. Mm-hmm. And that lack of ability to prove you know stuff that just kept you that everything you've learned, every great lesson you've ever had, never happened. Not for you, Neil, mm. because you're autistic. So this is what we've got to change. Um, there's a great historical analogy, which is deafness. Um, for all of human history, if you were deaf, you were stupid and less than human until, until what? Until sign language gets invented by a French guy in the 1830s, 1840s, I think. Uh, until then, that's, 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 that's why we've got deaf and dumb. Uh, imagine that now. Imagine how wrong, how wrong-headed is that? All the sort of sharp, bright, clever, deaf people that you've met, uh, you know, it, 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 is, it is beyond obscene that we would call them stupid. Uh, they're not. They're just deaf. Like, what's wrong with you people? Do you mean that? No, they're not stupid. They're deaf. Um, and, scary. Um, now, no, no, you're, you're damn right it's scary because uh, that's where my that's where people like my son are right now. Uh, now things are changing a little bit. There's a bit of a wind of change, and I'm really, really happy. I'm proud. I'm proud for the reason I jump, not of me, but I'm proud to have been a tiny part of allowing, be careful what I say here, what is much more important than all of my novels, anything I've written, anything for the whole of my life is the reason I jump, uh, because this is spreading that message, that we are getting autism horribly wrong, uh, horribly wrong because the wrongnesses we are perpetuating are making the lives of people with autism, um, slash autistic people, as politics over the description is, but uh, we're, getting, we're, we're making the lives of, of autistic people wrong, uh, I mean worse, by the things we're getting wrong about autism. And, um, and that is, well, that's, um, that's my mission for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, for while I'm here, you know, I can help my son by trying to improve the level of intelligence around public discourse relating to autism. There's a political aspect to this. Once you know what I've just said, then a classroom assistant needs to be not just kind of an added extra if the school's feeling rich this year. It it has to be a human right. Uh, Mm -hmm. And Sorry, society, but we have to find the money for this. I know we have to find the money for lots of other things as well, but we also have to find the money for this. And again, sorry, billionaires, sorry, millionaires. But if this means we have to raise a level of taxation to help people um, who need that help to take their part as fully-fledged members of the human race and of society, and in the long run to turn them into taxpayers. It's not why you do it, but this is a beautiful benefit of it. Uh, then then that's what we have to do. We need to reorganise society and, dare I say it, to redistribute income. Um, mm-hmm. No, uh, it's that the... the uh, I was speaking with Naoki's parents and... Um, um, so this book did really well, and suddenly he had book deals all over the world, and sold into the six figures in in in, in the UK and in the states. Uh, thank you, John Stewart, very very much. By the way, just if you happen to be listening, and Whoopi um, Goldberg, and um, and he became a taxpayer, and he he was paying more in tax to uh, than his dad was, uh, and and his parents were just so proud about that, and he was so proud about it. You know, um, just compare that to the attitude that most of <laughs> uh, the, it, it, it's the antithesis of a tax avoidance. It's pride in paying your tax. Mm-hmm. The world would be a better place if we had a little bit more of that, don't you think? Totally. I did a YouTube video called Why You Should Love Paying Your Taxes. It's been a controversial video that I made, but I made this and I flash on screen. Like, do you like roads? Are you enjoying the safety of the tires that you, you're driving on? Do you enjoy the fact that your food isn't poisonous? Are, are you like, like, do you, you know, I went on this like rant and I, I let it be filmed and posted, but yeah, it was controversial, but you know, I'm a Canadian. So this is the social net that I've come to rely on and, and believe in. Um, and a great, great, great example of why you can make the economic argument on top of everything else as a human right. Yeah, yeah. This if book you really mo- want an economic argument, then yes, you're making taxpayers. 
Exactly. And this book moved me a few years ago, David, when I, I found it by just looking for other things with your name on it. That's I ran out of stuff that you'd written that I'd read. And I was like, what else is, is there in the section? And like the books are near my house, an incredible four story kind of n- new used remainder bookstore had this filed right beside your literature. So I grabbed it and it moved me. It shook me. I recommended it in my book club. I revisited it last night. Many passages jump out at me, but on page 88, one particular, I'd love to just read quickly. It's just a few Please sentences. Do. Please do. Um, just by looking at nature, I feel as if I'm being swallowed up into it. And in that moment, I get the sensation that my body's now a speck, a speck from long before I was born, a speck that is melting into nature herself. This sensation is so amazing that I forget that I'm a human being and one with special needs to boot. Hmm. Hmm. Sometimes I go walking with my son uh, in, in, in the woods and uh, um, he, uh, we've got beech trees in, in the woods near here. And when beech trees, uh, they've got these lovely thin uh, membranous paper-like leaves uh i'm bluffing that membranous is a real word it might not be but you can check afterwards membrane like and they're really thin and they cast shadows on leaves underneath so you get this beautiful bedazzling this mesmerizing effect when the sun shines down on you through beech trees and i remember shortly after translating that uh, I took my son to the woods and it was spring and the new beach leaves were out and he just stood and just stared up at it and 20 minutes passed, maybe 30 minutes passed. He was just in that spell. Sort of, um, and, and yeah, so that's my association with that particular passage. Well, in, in it, I also hear, it's a beautiful visualization and in it, I also hear this this phrase, um, my body's now a speck, a speck from long before I was born, a speck that is melting into nature herself. I want to tie this back to your earlier point about memory. Um, do you ever think about managing, shifting, or connecting your energy with with the energy kind of beyond you or forget you're a human being? Uh, I, I feel that way when I read your stuff, but how do you think about energy that way in this sort of universal form that he's talking about? we're venturing into kind of new age spiritual territory, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to go there just a little bit, if you're okay with it. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the things about the book as well. I, I, I never really considered that my son would be thinking about time and life after death. And it never occurred to me to talk to him about the soul or, and that some people believe there is one and people believe there isn't. Uh, but now I know. And, uh, you know, I've, it's worth mentioning because uh, if you are a texticator, uh, if you are a texticating autistic person, then unfortunately um, you will meet scepticism uh, that won't be dispelled until people have seen you do it with their own eyes. So uh, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I'm at that point with Naoki and I've met him about three times and I've asked him about kind of whether he thinks about the soul and I've asked him, you know, um, I, I did an, an interview very early on with someone who expressed doubt that the book could possibly be authentic because mm-hmm. here is, here's this autistic person talking about metaphor and her autistic daughter kind of, couldn't spell metaphor let alone know what a metaphor is she told me quite accus- um, accusatively and, uh, and 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 antagonistically now now i know how to handle that but uh, but at the time it was sort of kind of was, it was just kind of shocked and astonished and 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 didn't really have a, um didn't really have a good answer but i've since met now okay and i said you know um uh, I, I i told him about it um and 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 asked him to speak to me about metaphor and he did pretty eloquently before my very eyes um how, and, so how would you answer that woman today uh i would i would say it's plastered still online you know you do when you google the, the book or look at your wikipedia yeah. profile it does still there is tr- quite yeah, a lot yeah. of paragraphs yeah. still citing these controversies sure um yeah 
I mean, um, once something's on Wikipedia, you can counter it, but you can't erase mm-hmm. it. And, right. And it's just the way it works pretty much. Uh, I would say, firstly, please don't believe me. Just go onto YouTube, mm-hmm. type in his name, and look at him yourself. Right. Now, and, 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 and it, you know, why would I lie, really? Yeah. I mean, why, why would I? Why? Well, yeah, and let's not. Uh, yeah, I don't want to. Let's put a sewer. Let's do a sewer cover on that one because I, I was not going to approach it. But you, you brought. I was curious how you answered. But the, on, the point, on the new agey stuff on managing, shifting, connecting energy, sure. I want to just yeah, sit sure. there for a second. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, um, I'm a. I'm probably a zealous agnostic. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's anything. I, I don't know if there's a um, if if there's anything after we die. I don't know if the soul is real. Uh, I don't know if we come back in in some form. I don't know if we if it's meaningful to say that we are all connected in some uh, mycelium like underground way. Uh, I really don't know. And you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I kind of like it that way. I like not knowing. Uh, in a strange sense, it's the best of both worlds. We, we, we can stay. We don't have to kiss goodbye to, 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 to the pragmatic, rational view of the world that has given us so many things we so quickly forget. Our lives are so, so, so very much better for almost all of us at a planet-wide level than they would have been for great, 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 great grandparents. Uh, why? It's the rash- it's it's stuff that the rational mind has sorted out. It's science and tech. Uh, that's why all the things we take for granted and sometimes reject, uh, even though we're in, even though we start enjoying the, the benefits. Of them from the from before we're even born from conception onwards, uh, so we still get to enjoy these in 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 an agnostic view of things. But but it kind of leaves the door open for for I don't know. Do you want to call it spookier stuff, more spiritual stuff, more new mm-hmm. agey stuff, uh, more quantum stuff? Um, I don't know. And so it's all it's it's all built around that. I don't know really. I, I, love, this. Well, I um, love the firmness in the not knowing. That's quite attractive to me. The firmness in the not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, I will tell you this. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, uh, I was about to backtrack and I'm still about to backtrack, but I started to finish. So, uh, so my son, um, he says individual words. He sometimes puts two or three, four words together and he's got a few set pieces usually for things he wants. Um, Often heated up in the microwave, please. You ain't gonna say that. Uh, but um, uh, how long would you like it, me to heat it up for? Um, would be would be a very different proposition. Uh, so um, individual words. Yeah, he, he, again, it was around. It was around kind of first encounter with the reason I jumped time. Again, we were walking in the beech woods and the aforementioned beech woods, and just before then. Uh, uh, we'd had a cat and the cat got run over and I was it's simply new and um, I'm, 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 I'm sort of unusual maybe I'm a both a cat guy and a dog guy I really do like both but for but for really different reasons uh, I'd love sometimes the cat would climb up on my lap while I was writing and just nestle in the crook of my elbow and just and I, I sort of love that trust, and I love the vibrations you feel from them when they're purring, uh, and maybe the hearts as well. It's sort of holding this sort of strange cross between a hot water bottle and a vibrator. <laughs> if, if, uh, if, um, if 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 you'd excuse that hybrid, um, <laughs> I on, love it. On You're your spawning story. new product ideas here. <laughs> um, And so I was walking along behind my son in the woods, thinking very, very strongly about how I used to like holding the cat. His name was Willow, in in the kind of on my forearm, just in 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 the crook of my arm. There, swear to God, Neil, my son stopped. He was about I can still see this. He's about twenty feet in front of me. He stopped and he turned round and he looked at me and he said, "Cat." And 
I still don't know what to make of that, and I'll leave you to make of that what you will. And it might be uh, the classic confusion between correlation of things happening to happen at the same time uh, and uh, causation. One thing happens because of the other, um, which I think still think is 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 behind most of what gets termed spiritual or spooky or whatever. Um, but 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 that happened. It, it's not a trick of memory. It's not a trick of anything. It was just very clear. And no cat was not a word that my son was ever in the habit of saying. I don't think he said it since. Uh, not out of the blue like that. Um, so, yeah, there you go. I haven't told anyone that, and now I have. <laughs> when what what um, I know you say I still don't know what to make of that. I feel like in my life I've had similar experiences. Have you? Um, yeah, a, th- a thought that I'm really thinking hard upon, even just to not to compare them, but you know, when, when we're both thinking of a word together and you know, it's right in both of our brains, you know, there it, something's happening there that I can feel that's harder over virtual, of course, but there's something happening in both of our minds because of what's happening in the other, it mm. seems to me. I guess I'm a little bit further down the line of believing that there is a connective energy, like Naoki was saying, or that mm. we could lean back somewhat metaphysically and be all of the people, not reincarnation, which my mom does believe in as a Hindu, but mm. but more just like there is the energy of the other in ourselves. And Dr. Laura Markham, who is a child psychologist who's written a number of best-selling books and was our guest uh, in in chapter uh, 46 of this podcast, she believes that what is happening to parents and children today is working through traumas of, she said, you know, 10 generations ago, slowly over time, generationally stopping in between the thinking and doing parts of our brain to wrestle with the fact that she said for herself, 10 generations ago, my ancestor was hung at the Salem witch trials, you know, and I am still processing the trauma of that worked through the generations of experiencing, knowing, parenting through that. And I don't know, I I know we're in that territory that feels maybe uncomfortable, but I I wanted to go there with you because your books feel that way to me too. Maybe my books go into that territory more than I do. Um, maybe my books are like diving bells. They're sort of trips down there, and then I can explore around there a little bit in the book, and then maybe I come back up again. I mean, um, going back ten, going back ten generations, I, 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 the discomfort I feel from that is, good. it's it's and obviously uh, no. No disrespect to your guest at all, but but the discomfort I feel is 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 to do with the enormity of the task of ever sifting anything, of ever settling anything. If 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 essentially you go back X generations, sort of what space is there, what room is there to sort anything else in in this life, this one that we know we have. Uh, uh, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, I do. I know. I, I, you, 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 what, what, you, you being in the you UK, surely don't have a chance. Yeah. yeah. You, 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 you kind of surely you sort of. It's, it's like being at the mercy of ten whirlpools all at once. You're just right. not be able to put your head above the water ever. Well, and that's why she's saying that that's where she says the work is as a parent. You know, it's it's recognizing that and, and processing the traumas of previous generations so that you can be a better parent, you know, than, than you may have received. Because she said a lot of people experience the trauma. But even as something is like, I'm not in the same place as you right now, David. We're not in the same country. There's an ocean between us. Um, you're in the UK. I'm in Canada. You just talked about your autistic son and the idea that sorry, billionaires, sorry, millionaires. But, you know, let's lean it. There's something connective, though, even, you know, in the ideas that you're proposing, I think, in a good way, that we're all in this together. And and by the way, we're talking during the pandemic and during the Black Lives Matters movement. And mm-hmm. and to what extent do I feel the pain of a black person in the States? I feel it. I don't 
don't know if I feel it as much as my wife does, who is more empath, an empathetic person than me, maybe. But like, I, I can feel, I can feel something there, you know, mm-hmm. about a, a totally different culture and country than me. And that's kind of what I'm saying. I, I, um, yeah. Yeah. I want to, in my own brain, in my own mind, tap, try to tap into that more. And I'm looking for kind of places to dig so that I can feel it. I'd like to float this back, um, if we're still okay for time, Neil. Um, yeah. Just just in, in response to what you said, I mean, I think my wife would be also more of a believer than I am. Um, and, and so we talk about this quite a lot. Um, and one one sort of conclusion, one one, and sometimes the conversation can get a bit heated, but the where we overlap and 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 where it's sort of smart, I think, for marital harmony to allow the conversation to end is to think in terms of a Van Di- uh, of a Venn diagram, and there's mm-hmm. an overlapping segment in the middle, and in this overlapping segment, there's a sort of it doesn't matter if it's real or not what matters is say we so if you believe in this connectivity there's this 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 uh empathic network this ideosphere um then that's fine if you believe there's a literal connection um a bit like the netflix show sensate that where where, where uh, people kind of get people do start to literally experience what other people are experiencing it if you believe something like that is possible then fine uh if you don't believe it it's still useful as a metaphor um if you don't believe there's some literal never identified by science connection between all of us um that might exist on some quantum level that we haven't identified yet then fine, you believe it. But even if you don't believe it, where's the harm in thinking that maybe it is real? Um, I'm not expressing this well. If it's a metaphor, then it doesn't matter that you're wrong. Kind of that empathy should still be there. That sense of connection mm-hmm. should still be there. That idea that um, that if there isn't justice for everybody, then there's no justice for anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And in the Venn diagram, the two circles are two opposing thoughts, but the overlap, if I'm following you, is the behavior yeah. that follows. Yes, yes. And and the and the difference between one person thinking that's literally right and the other think and the other person thinking, no, it's not a literal fact that can be ascertained by physics. Uh but ideologically, uh I want to live in a society like that. So who cares if it's literally scientifically ascertainable or not? Uh, let's act as if it is and act accordingly. Ta-da. That's my soapbox. Uh, I, it's not a soapbox. It is a beautiful megaphone, and I am feeling the ripples from it, and I really appreciate it. David, you have given us three incredible, moving, shape-shifting, wonderful books as your three formative books for this show. I oh, typically you. close off my conversations uh, when I am able to with a quick, fast money round of questions around books. Do you mind if we try that to close us off today? Shoot. Uh, I have no idea how I will. Um, um, uh, how <laughs> the the oh, word fast is in quotes, by the way. So any of these, you can you can make it a one word, you can make it a pass, or you can go on a soapbox. We, we would pleasurably listen to you. Uh, okay. Fast money round. Number one, how do you organize your books? They organize themselves. Uh, it takes a while to know how they want to do that, and I go wrong once or twice. And aspiring writers, that's fine too. Uh, you have to go wrong before you can go right. So don't worry if you get to page 60 or page 80 and think, I thought this was the building, but it's actually just scaffolding. That's fine. That's normal. And knowing that is actually progress. So sometimes going back and starting again is moving forwards. And that is a beautiful answer to a question that I very poorly wrote, clearly, because you told us how you organize your books that you write in your home, in your in your library, or your living room. How do you organize your books? <laughs> Neil Pasricha, note to self, rewrite this question. <laughs> um, 
that's uh, that says much more about me than you. Don't worry. Um, ah, there's not a lot of organisation. Um, there's there's tribal areas of books that are to do with what I'm working on. Books that I really need to get read soon. They're near my bed. Books that I have read that I don't want to say goodbye to. Um, uh, proofs compiling through the door to scary rate, as you know. Um, some of them hang around. Uh, yeah, uh, insufficiently is the one word answer to your question. I organize my books insufficiently. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. On that topic, what is your book lending policy? Um, I don't have many friends, so I don't really lend books out much. <laughs> I don't really lend books too. Uh, if I read something I really like, then I post it to my mum or my brother and, and say, this is yours, please pass it on. Um, really, kind of, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a small number of books that for sentimental or irreplaceable purposes, I just, I, I just don't and wouldn't lend out. But I've got so many, you know, what it's like... Um, it's generally, I'm generally really happy to pass books on. And uh, so I don't lend books, I give books. That's pretty much it. Mm, the exact opposite of Malcolm Gladwell's book lending policy on chapter 37 of the show, where he answered with the one word reply, grudging. <laughs> um, I, 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 envy, I envy you that. He's great. Have you read his most recent one? Um, yes, Talking to Strangers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's great, wasn't it? Yes, and it goes into the, the the deep end, like it goes into the murkier, beautiful water. He is uh, ripening by the decade, as they say. Um, what is your favorite bookstore, living or dead? Wow. Wow. Um, you know, I'm going to stay local. I'm going to go for Kerr's Books in Clonakilty in County Cork. Because it's run by a very small team, and they take great pride in their shop, and the window is polished every single day, and the shelves are dusted every single day, and they're friendly, and you go in and you come out feeling just happier. Uh, it's, it's it's a bookshop that is also mental health mm. in a way. In a way, booksellers are frontline workers, frontline workers of the mind. Um, wow. And, wow, that's and amazing! God bless them all. Well, uh, whatever God you believe in, God bless books eyes. So uh, yes. yes. Uh, side note for chapter fifty six of three books, we interviewed Kate, the therapist, or Kate Scowan, who runs the largest and only mental health themed bookstore in Toronto, wow. uh, with therapy wow. in the back. Uh, oh. By the way, when you answered that question with Kurz, I, I had dug up a quote from you that you said in 2007 in Stop Smiling magazine. You said, <laughs> what do I miss? Secondhand bookshops where I can find things I had no idea I wanted. Hmm. Uh, there's still a few around. So um, so I would uh, tell myself to um, – uh, I would tell my younger self to kind of um, – uh, Cheer up a bit on that front. <laughs> Great. David, do you have a white whale book or a book you have been chasing the longest? As a reader, I mean, is there a book that's on your to-be-read pile forever? Um, the cool answer would be Moby Dick, because that is the white whale book. But uh, <laughs> I have actually read it a couple of times. Oh, what, what should I be reading? What should I have read? Um <sighs> I know there's lots of things I haven't, lots and lots of things I haven't, lots of classics, lots of, and, and you sort of get into your 50s, you start to do the arithmetic, don't you? Um, but if I'm honest, the answer is no. Uh, if, 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 if I want to read a book that badly, then I'll read it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and just kind of watch less Netflix. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but not really. No, no um, you complimented David Sedaris earlier. He's the only other guest that said the exact same answer. And he also said, if it's hard for me, I audiobook it and I'm done with it. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, um, now, the last um, question of all, you have given us a very, very, very generous dollop or whatever the bigger version of dollop is of your time. 
Can you extrapolate everything we've been talking about into a final piece or two of hard-fought wisdom? Our, our show is called Three Books. It's for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Many of them aspire towards better reading and to better writing. Do you have a piece of final wisdom you may, with a pause, leave us with today? Um, I think I'd like to repeat myself, if I may. Um, you can't improve nothing. Just write it. It doesn't matter if it's rubbish. You should see my first manuscripts. They're rubbish. And and that's fine, because you can improve rubbish. You can sift it. Find the things that aren't rubbish. Nurture those. Grow them up, maybe like poles out of grit. Um, and... Going wrong can be your ally. All you have to do is work out why you've gone wrong. And that is a necessary step towards going right. So don't be discouraged when you look at what you wrote yesterday and thought, I thought it was good then, but God, it's awful. But just keep looking. You'll find a few things in it that aren't awful. Uh, now, to the best of my knowledge, that is how everybody writes. That's it. Keep looking, extrapolating. You can't rewrite it till you write it. Uh, a, a pleasure and a privilege and an honor. David Mitchell, thank you so much for coming on Three Books. I've had a great time, Neil. Thank you. You keep up the great work. Uh, I will listen to your future podcasts with enormous interest. And uh, stay safe during the pandemic. And, and I hope one day I will get to Toronto again in the not too distant future. And please um, stay in touch. It'd be great to meet up. Thank you so much. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Hey, everybody, it's just me. It's just Neil again, hanging out at home in my basement with my backpack full of wires. Oh, yeah. I was not expecting, even though I'd heard a number of interviews with David, for the wide and deep well of humility that this guy comes from. Uh, what an incredible human being. I fell deeper in love with him while talking to him than I thought I could or would, but I did. And the phrasing, the words, hang out till the end of this show, guys, because it is going to be the most epic word cloud ever. We highlight the word of the chapter as we always do at the end of the show. Um, Art should be an anti-snobbery force. This is a guy who writes books that are certainly not simple. <laughs> if you have read Cloud Atlas or know that it's six interwoven Russian dolled novellas written across centuries. Uh, at the same time, he writes with an accessibility that makes people like me, you know, I said I'm a, you know, I'm like a novice reader. I'm not, I'm not as, I'm not as big a reader as someone like David is like, I can reach for these books and I can get them and I can sit for them. I can pass them around comfortably to anybody. Art should be an anti-snobbery force. What else did he say? It should raise no eyebrows if the writer wishes to treat genre as an organ of a novel. I loved that. And how about this one? All books want to be used. If I was a book, I would want to be used. <laughs> There's so many quotes. A signpost is not the place it's pointing to. It occupies you and you occupy it. I could go on and on and on. So many phrases and quotes jump out from the book. I am so grateful to Mr. David Mitchell for giving us three more books to add to our top 1,000. For new listeners, remember, you can go over to threebooks.co slash the top 1,000, just a link at the top there, threebooks.co, and it's a list of every single formative book ever mentioned on the show. We've also changed our policy. We no longer link to Amazon. Uh, we want to support independent booksellers and we want to support local retailers and national retailers more. So we are linking as best we can to Project Gutenberg if things are out of print, which is, you know, um, things like the Duel would be out of print by Chekhov. And we are trying to link to Wikipedia pages and we are trying to link to the author's own home pages. Let you live in the home of, that the author had created. Um, so what did he add? What did he add? He added number. Let me get the numbers right here. 
Number 830, a wizard of Earthsea. That's E-A-R-T-H-S-E-A, not Earthsea, as I said at the show, by Ursula K. Le Guin. Last name is L-E space, capital G-U-I-N. He gave us number 829, The Duel. That's D-U-E-L, Duel, The Duel, by Anton Chekhov, C-H-E-K-H-O-V, written in 1891. And he gave us number 828, The Reason I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13-Year-Old with Autism, by Naoki Higashida. And I also want to mention that David Mitchell wrote in an email to me before we chose that book. He said, if that seems self-promotion-like, then I also would suggest one of these other two books. And I'm just going to mention them. One of them is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And he called it an oasis in time, you know, long, long ago and far away. This book has already been added to our top 1000 by Ryan Holiday. So we will add an asterisk to that and make a note in our FAQ that it has been repicked. Okay. That is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. If you have not heard our chapter with Ryan Holiday, then trek back about a dozen shows and you will find that great conversation with Ryan, author of The Obstacles Away, Ego is the Enemy, and so on. And he gave us The Letters of Vincent Van Gogh, which he thought were the truest depiction of an artist ever. That book has not been added. It's really not a book. It's a series of letters, but of course, there's many different versions of it. We have not added that to the top 1,000, and we will not add it, but I wanted to give a little shout out. If you made it all the way to the end, there's a little Easter egg. If you want to go deeper into David, check, and you want to like get into this guy's mind even more, then check up the letters of Vincent Van Gogh, mostly written to and from his brother, Theo. Okay. Now... A pause, a reflection, uh, a blanket of energy uh, is what I feel like I'm surrounding myself in. Um, the, 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 The strength of mind to be able to display such impressive and electric literary genius combined with a deep sense of affability and humility and humanity this is a guy who I aspire to be more like. Um, I love David Mitchell. I love what he represents to the world. I love the gifts he is giving us. I am so honored ha- to have had him on three books. And it was touching after we pressed stop on the record. He actually said to me, wow, I've never had a, a, a chat like that before. We were speaking like we were in a pub together. Uh, you're a great listener. I love the conversation. And that's not a credit to me. That's a credit to him. The fact that he could go there with us, he could let us kind of meander that, you know, a couple of times he said, if we have time, and I was like, sure, <laughs> I've got time. I got time. We can talk for 20, 20, 10 hours. And I felt a bit embarrassed telling the publicist that we ran that long afterwards because they, you know, they had done such a gift to give us this chat. But at the same time, I just feel like this isn't a gift for me. It's a gift for us. It's a gift for the world. When you want to become a better writer, when you want to become a better reader, when you want to dip into what really matters in life, this conversation is one that I hope that you will revisit again and again, as I will. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now... If you're still here, I'd like to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. Regular three books listeners will know this is one of three clubs that we have on this show. End of the podcast club is where we get to hang out at the end. You talk directly to me. I play your voicemails to 1833-READ-A-LOT. I read your letters, good, bad, and ugly. You give me criticism, constructive criticism. Uh, You make fun of my voice, whatever it is. Um, And then we play a a word of the chapter. And sometimes we have a couple other Easter eggs. So, So that's what you're in right now. That's the club you're here for. That's the end of the podcast club. We also have the cover to cover club. And on chapter 58, it's getting harder and harder for me to say this, but these are the people who've decided that for 14 years, they're going to hang out with us. They're going to hang out in this literary universe that we are creating, talking to people like sex workers in Omaha, Nebraska, feminists in Brooklyn, New York, uh, heads of TED in New York City, David Sedaris, Malcolm Gladwell, Judy Bloom. You want to hang out with people like this? Then you're in the cover to cover club. That means you are taking a stab at listening to every single chapter of three books. There's 333 of them. Just You don't got to listen all the way. It just means that you're trying to be part of the whole book. You are a completist like me. 
And then finally, we have the Secret Club. What can I tell you about the Secret Club? Is uh, you can't. I can't tell you about it. All I can tell you is that uh, you can only find out clues to the Secret Club by calling our phone number. It is a one hundred percent analog only fan club, and that's all I can say about that. What is our phone number? Well, indeed, it is one eight three three read a lot. Again, it's one eight three three read a lot. And let's kick off the end of the podcast club as we always do by going to the phones. Hi, Neil. It's Dave calling, avid uh, follower of three books. I, um, over the COVID uh, crisis isolation, I noticed your posting Zoom audio for your podcasts. And uh, as an audio technician myself, I wished uh, that it could sound better because I love your voice and the voice of your of your interviews. So if you want more information about that, you should check out Zencaster, Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, not E-R. And it's an amazing uh, digital streaming app that allows you to record people at higher resolution while also running a Zoom call. Anyway, just want to leave that message. Keep up the great work and, um, and the amazing emails. Bye for now. We have the best listeners ever, don't we, guys? We do. Three Books listeners are gems. They're book people. They understand that books are magic. They sift backwards into invisible universes where we all get to be nice to each other and humble with each other and kind to each other, the way David Mitchell was with us today and the way Dave was with us leaving that voicemail. Did you notice that the sound on this this chapter, chapter 58 with David Mitchell sounded better? Well, guess who we have to thank for that? Dave. Dave of DB Audio, he like reached out with the voicemail, also dropped me a line. I reached back out to him. He set me up with my Zoom recorder at home, figured out how to use Zencaster. The sound, I'm working on it. I'm not perfect at it. But if it's better on this show, it's because of Dave. Uh, I can't thank Dave enough. And then when I said, Dave, can you send me an invoice? I want to pay you for your time and all this stuff. He's like, no, no, keep three books going till 2031. That is a gift in my life. And that's all I need from you, Neil. And good motivation for me. You know, I always feel like the world is about karma, right? Sharing, giving as much as you can. David Mitchell gave us a gift. Dave at DB Audio gave us a gift. Let me give him a gift back. If you're interested in any audio needs or you have a, a, a challenge when you're recording a podcast or you're trying to get better sound for something you're working on, just go to dbaudio.ca. That's dbaudio.ca. No, that's not a, a something that Dave paid for, but he called me. He's a fan of the show. Let's support each other, guys. Thank you, Dave, so much for your call. Okay. And now it is time for the letter of the chapter. And this chapter's letter comes from Miss Martha Mills. You may remember we played a voicemail from Martha Mills a few chapters ago. So why would I read a letter from the same person? Well, here's why. Uh, Hi, Neil. Thank you so much for playing my response on your podcast. I had responded to your question about female protagonists in books. At the time I recorded my little ditty, I was driving to interview a nurse practitioner for a position in a nursing home. I'm a nurse practitioner and I manage a group of nursing homes in uh, 30 homes across North Carolina. I was not having the best day. I had just had to put down our dog of 12 years earlier in the week and also fill this unanticipated void in this rural facility. Your question sparked many good memories. I was very tall and shy growing up in my hometown of Miami, the youngest child in a family of three older brothers who were teenagers in the 60s when I was born. After I grew up, I used to tell my mom that my earliest memories of her were pacing the sidewalk, waiting for the motorcycles to return home. I loved Miami, but I was pretty much left to my own devices. I was so engrossed when I recorded my response to your question about female protagonists in uh, books for kids, I did not realize that my speed had crept up. I was pulled over at the exit for speed. I was speeding while <laughs> recording the, bo- the, 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 the voicemail to three books. I was going over 80 in a 70. I was actually in tears when the police officer pulled me over. It was just too much. I drive like an old lady most of the time because I drive all over the state through tiny towns where the speed drops from 45 to 25 in a second and tickets are expensive. But then 
I heard you, Neil, on the Coaching for Leaders podcast, where you mentioned how tickets are really so small in the big picture and that they help support the local economy. So I was glad to help boost the economy of the Virginia border town. Ha 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 ha. Thank you for your shout out to Garden, North Carolina. It's a nice little town on the outskirts of Raleigh. 10 minute drive to downtown. Like everything down here, it is changing. And that is good and not so good. If you ever get down this way, I hope our paths cross. Thank you for your thoughtful podcast and the interesting folks you bring on from Martha Mills. Martha, as always, when we play a letter on the show, uh, you win a copy of any of my books, whatever one you want. I just sign it and I put it in the mail. Only thing is, because of the pandemic, I've been slow on that. The post office, all that stuff, the lineups, we've been a little bit slower on that. But if you drop me a line, I add it to a spreadsheet. And then when things are a little safer, I will dump a whole bunch of books in the mail for anyone whose letter or voicemail is played on this show. Okay, you just have to drop me a line, let me know. Okay, and now it is time for the word of the chapter. As three books listeners know, this is where I play a word. Is it interesting? Is it one I didn't know? Usually, usually I didn't know the word. So I'm like, what is it? What's the etymology? What's the definition? And I share my learning with all of you because I just heard it from the guest. So for this chapter's word, are you ready for the most epic sound cloud of eternity? It's time for a word cloud, people, from Mr. David Mitchell himself. Which of these words would you pick? Over to you, David. Your bibliophilia for the Republic of Letters. Pigeonholing, analogous to a paint box, vestiges, sclerotic ideas, a sentient being, preen myself, tropes that you identify, a proto-Game of Thrones, sabbaticals, Byzantine plot, my sort of oeuvre. I'm being slightly flippant. I call these things eyewaths on a polder, uh, like a, uh, a big flat field that used to be a marsh. Flurrysome, despite the elasticated wrist, carte blanche. Beefy novella. Thickets. Extrapolate. Yay! Malaises. The seismic upheaval. The vertiginous effect. The peripatetic, a nice word for your fertile word cloud there, behoves as Eminent. I love etymology. Demonic cackle. Murahachibu. His ideograms. It's a homonym. Achilles heel. Texticate. Membranous. Bedazzling. Zealous agnostic. Mycelium like. Correlation. Empathic network. This ideosphere. Oh my goodness. That was the treasure chest of treasure chests. Uh, Byzantine, very tempting. Uh, beefy novella. I mean, how good was that? It reminds me of like jumbo shrimp and baked Alaska. Do you remember like, was it back in seventh grade when you learned about oxymorons? Oxymoron would be a great word to go into. Beefy novella is a wonderful oxymoron. Um, there are so many words I, I didn't know. I, I just don't know. My, my cedium, uh, the ideosphere, uh, he, he used this word text, um, Iwath, which I guess he, he made up, but they're it, 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 fl- flurious. <laughs> this is fun. I thought to respect the conversation we had about word origins in this show and to respect what I see as the sort of meta self-referential layer upon layer, mirror upon mirror nature of David's work, let us look up the definition and origin of the word etymology itself. Usually, we get into the etymology of words in the word of the chapter. In this case, let's define etymology. Okay, dictionary person, what do you say? Etymology. Etymology, the study of the origin of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. Etym, E-T-Y-M, means truest sense, original meaning. True, real, actual. It does come from Latin came out up into Greek and in French. And then ology or logia is the study of. So the study of true sense or original meaning. While researching etymology, I bumped into a couple of cousins of the word. Okay. So a cousin of etymology is this word toponymy, T-O-P-O-N-Y-M-Y. Do you know that word? That means the study of place names, their origins, meanings, and use. Okay. That's from the Greek word topos, place, and onomo, which means name. Toponymy, 
Topon, I'm saying that wrong. Topon Emi itself is a branch of onomastics. Onomastics. Do you know what this word means? O N O M A S T I C. Onomastics or onomatology is the study of the etymology, history, and use of proper names. What? Are you talking about, Neil? Well, I just want to hang out here for a second, pause the eye of the hurricane right over this little area of interest here. Onomastics, okay, uh, has two subcategories. Toponymy, I just mentioned, the study of place names. It also has anthroponomastics, which is the study of personal names. Don't you find that interesting? I remember going to my friend Mike Robertson's house growing up, and I walked into their house, and they had like a Robertson, like, what are those crests, like the history of their name represented in pictorial form? I have a boss, Dave Cheesewright, who has represented the names of him, his wife, and his kids in the form of um, a nature scene that every member of their family has got tattooed on their body. I think at some deep, deep primal level, anthroponomastics, the study of personal names, toponomastics, the study of place names, looping back up to etymology, the study and history of the words that we use, it's just so fascinating to us. It explains what can't be explained in these clumsy, articulate languages that we use to describe bigger, vaster emotions and feelings. This is what we got. So let's pause here. Let's thank Mr. David Mitchell for the treasure chest of words and let us make and declare that today's word of the chapter is indeed etymology, the study of the origin of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. Ha. <sighs> Phew. Do you feel like you just ran a marathon or do you feel like you just got a mind massage? I hope you feel one of those two or maybe somewhere in between. I think I'm on that spectrum with you. As I close off chapter 58 of three books, just a huge loving embrace to all of you. I feel your love every day. It is a huge gift in my life to get these voicemails, to get these letters to feel an invisible connective tissue across the world with people who love books or want to love books more. I think you are a special person to be part of a community where we can listen and hang out in such nerdy delight like we just did from Cork County, Ireland with the one and only David Mitchell. And as I bid you adieu, I say thank you to you. And I say until next time, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.
Thank you. 